one hand up, uh, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, you would have three minutes. Actually, let me sort of see if there are any additional hands. I don't see any other hands. So, uh, Mr. Rosenberg, your turn, three minutes. Good evening, thank you. Um, I'm here to speak briefly on the Almond Avenue project. I'm an assistant principal at Los Altos High School. You may remember we came to a meeting last spring where this topic was discussed and improvements have been made, particularly the El Monte end. And I know that Mr. Rodriguez presented a proposal, I think at the last meeting uh, for a change to the San Antonio and Almond intersection that would make things safer for biker and it's my bikers. And I understand that uh, the commission rejected that proposal, but asked for them to come back with something different. Uh, the current situation is not good. Um, the revisions to the bike lane did away with the bike lane for a portion of Almond Avenue and for the fire station. And so now students coming to Los Altos High School, and we're talking about more than 100 bikers um, in the morning and then going home in the evening are basically directed to violate traffic code and bike into traffic unsafely um, because a left turn onto Almond puts them into traffic um, at the time that there's the most traffic onto Almond. So I, I know that this is an item of concern to the commission and I just want to strongly advocate for a solution as soon as possible. We've kind of had the break of the distance learning without the bicyclists coming to school recently. We're hoping to have them back very soon, however, certainly next fall. And I'm hoping that uh, an improvement to that situation can be made as soon as possible. Great, thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. <clears throat> thank you. Any other item, any other members of the public who wish to speak on items not on the agenda? Okay, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and move into the uh, discussion of or consideration of items on the agenda. So first, with minutes, let me turn over to my fellow commissioners. Any uh, feedback on the minutes? Great, I see heads shaking, I'll take that as none. Okay, Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, if there is no other feedback, I could move to approve them with two amendments. Um, on item one, the headline talks about the October 28th, 2020 minutes, but it was really the December 10th, 2020 minutes that we approved. And on the second item, my recollection is it, it says that the conclusion was the commission recommended staff to present alternative ideas for the buffer zone. I thought we had recommended to not use the green bolsters and do observation in the beginning. Uh, that is my recollection to yeah. vice chair. Yes, indeed. Any other comments on those two amendments from the vice chair? Okay, so do we have a, we have a motion? Right. So that was my motion to approve two, them with those two amendments. Two amendments. Yep. Okay. I, I second the motion uh, with the two amendments as stated by Vice Chair Banerjee. Okay, great. All in favor, raise your hand on the screen, please. Okay, we have a unanimous here. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Jaime Ngaku, I guess you took note of the amendments? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Very well. So with that, we move to item number two on the agenda, which is the review of 355 First Street. And I see uh, we have staff ready to go for that. Guido, go for it. Good evening, Complete Streets Commission. I just wanted to do a quick overview of the project. We also have the project applicant here as well. They can go a little bit more in detail. Um, so this is just a rendering of, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So this is just a rendering of the project. Um, these are the planning permits that the applicant will be requesting, a design review permit, the actual building, a tentative map for the units, and a sequence for approximately uh, a 50 unit condo project with eight below market rate units. Um, with seven moderate and a one low income unit. Let me let me put this. In. Um, bonus concession. You, you're, you're, uh, there's a lot of static on the connection. Is it just uh, all of us? We see the same thing. I can't. I can't hear it. It feels like a goldfish underwater. Yeah. So Vito, could you please um, uh, check your connection? And try again. Um, 
or maybe you re repeat what you just said and then we'll tell you when to. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Perhaps uh, turn off your video so you know you have more bandwidth. Perhaps that might help. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? And if anybody's playing Fortnite, turn that off too. Yes. Go ahead, Guido. Okay, sounds good. So um, it's a design review, tentative map, and CEQA clearance for a 50-unit condo project with eight BMR units, uh, seven moderate, one uh, low-income units. Um, uh, four units, uh, four lots will need to be merged and then re-subdivided per the Subdivision Map Act. Um, the project is eligible for one density bonus concession for height, and there are some parking ratio reductions that are being requested per density bonus law. So these are the four parcels in question. It does have a CDR3 a zoning designation. And it is uh, being filed under SB 330. Um, SB 330 has two key parts, the uh, pre-application phase and then the formal submittal. Uh, right now, we're in the pre-application phase. Uh, we are allowed to do our normal community outreach, uh, have meetings with complete streets and study sessions with the Planning Commission. Um, what SB 330 really does is it gives the applicant some assurances that the rules of the road will not be changed uh, midstream. So whatever um, rules and regulations were in place as of December 22nd when the applicant filed the permit, those are the rules of the road for this project. If they meet certain criteria in terms of filing the formal application within 180 days. Uh, when the formal submittal is filed, probably in the next four to six weeks, uh, we will undertake an environmental CEQA review. And then the real big uh, caveat uh, for the SB 330 projects is the city is limited to no more than five public hearings or meetings. Um, so that's why I've asked the applicant and they've agreed to come to Complete Streets tonight to get some preliminary feedback. And when the formal submittal is filed, we will probably more than likely have to have a joint meeting of the Complete Streets and Commission um, so that we can make sure we have as much community input as possible. Before you, you cut out again. So the, the Complete Streets Commission will have a joint meeting with whom? With the Planning Commission when the formal submittal happens. Um, because we probably want to give the City Council at least three meetings um, to review this. So we probably want to have at least two joint meetings with Complete Streets and the Planning Commission. That, that just explains the two phases of SB 330. This is the project timeline. They filed December 22nd. We had a community meeting January 11th. We had a study session with the Planning Commission January 21st. And then now we're here with Complete Streets tonight. In terms of the bike pedestrian, there is a uh, bus stop within 0.3 of a mile of the site. They are providing the required VTA bicycle parking within the site plan, and I did reference that in the staff report. And in terms of the environmental review and in terms of uh, how it affects complete streets, um, a traffic impact analysis will be required. Uh, VMT analysis will be required for this project, and uh, an initial study mitigated next step will be required for the project. Um, so the next steps is um, take your initial questions, and then at the conclusion of this uh, meeting, um, hopefully be able to get the minutes of this meeting to the applicant so we can have written documentation of what the commission's asking for. Uh, when the formal submittal comes in, we will begin the environmental CEQA process uh, review. And the next time you guys will see this project will be the Joint Planning Commission Complete Streets Commission meeting. So that concludes my initial presentation. And sorry about the choppiness. No worries. Thank you, Guido. Um, does the applicant wish to add any more color to your presentation, Guido? Uh, 
Jeff Potts is the architect. Uh, he is on the call right now. Mr. Potts, would you like to add any more information to what the city staff presented? Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have a raise my hand function here on my particular setup of ring. Um, I could certainly walk you through the project in a little more detail if you haven't had a chance already to review it. I'd be happy to do that. Um, or we're here to just kind of get comments um, on the project. But if uh, you would like, I can share my screen and kind of walk you through the, the basics of the uh, access and parking and things like that. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. All right, can everybody see the screen and still hear me at the same time? Yes. Great. As uh, Guido mentioned, it's, uh, this is a merger of four parcels at the corner of First Street here at uh, Page Bottom and Whitney Street. Um, and there's an existing alley uh, behind the project. Um, access to the uh, underground parking will be from a ramp off of the alleyway. Um, we're proposing uh, to uh, kind of match what's happened down the alley further. A two-foot alley uh, easement uh, be placed uh, along the property for the future uh, two-foot widening of the alley, uh, potentially on both sides, but but definitely on this side of the of the alley, um, there'll be a two-foot widening. Um, Along First Street, um, there is also a one-foot uh, sidewalk easement for a widening of the sidewalk, and that too is consistent with a couple of projects that have been approved and are underway uh, further down First Street between Whitney and Lyell. Um, as uh, Guido mentioned, we'll be um, looking at some parking reductions based on the state density bonus law, um, but we do also have um, some options to that. Um, the parking per the city's code um, at this, uh, based on this uh, layout would be 113 required spaces. Uh, that'd be 102 per unit for guests, or for, for the uh, residents, sorry, and 13 uh, spaces for the guests. Um, per the state uh, density bonus law, the total spaces required would be 96. Um, you know, a difference of uh, seven, 17 spaces. Um, as currently proposed, we have 111 spaces. So although we're invoking the uh, density bonus um, reduction, you can see that we're talking about a reduction currently of two parking spaces. Um, not the full reduction of the 17 parking spaces. And I'm going to just limit my comments here to access and things of that nature. And then you can ask any other questions that you'd like to ask about any other features of the building. Um, so uh, the first level of parking, um, I'm sorry, this is the lowest level of parking. We've got the two exits elevator, some resident bike lockers, as well as some additional bike racks at that level. Um, currently, as configured, all of the parking spaces meet the city's nine by 18 parking space requirement, uh, and the drive aisles meet the city's 26 foot wide um, drive aisle requirement. Um, and then at the next level, um, We'd be coming down above this and again we have additional uh, residential bike lockers um, the trash room and additional uh, bike racks in this location along with the handicap parking um, we'll be revising the access actually to this uh, residential bike storage to come off of this striped area as opposed to the ramp area just from us for a safety uh, factor of safety there um, we did bring up with the planning commission um, in the workshop and you know got some feedback you know we have uh, some space in this garage really sort of uh, through this area here uh, where these are are not a parking space width um, and we did propose or or discuss the the notion that with some very 
minor uh, waiver to have, you know, 10 or 20% of the parking spaces be the eight and a half foot width, which I know the city has approved on other projects, um, that we could easily incorporate these four parking spaces, two at each level, and, and potentially more um, at each level if we, you know, went to eight foot six in, you know, a small row at each floor and kept the balance at the wider parking space. So that's something where uh, we would definitely explore uh, pending feedback that, that led us in that direction. That would get us to, you know, the city standard parking um, and maybe even a few additional spaces above the city standard parking. Uh, so it's something, you know, definitely worth exploring should it be, uh, you know, the, the direction of the fair, various uh, city commissions. From, a, from an access standpoint, really that's, those are the main things with the, the main entry to the building is about uh, a third of the way down from the Whitney First Street corner. Uh, building will be accessed here. There'll be a open uh, court here with uh, out open to the sky with light and uh, just to enhance the pedestrian sort of access experience here. Um, and again, ramp at the back corner, emergency stair at the back corner to the alley and the main stair of the building there uh, centrally located. And those are really the main uh, access and pedestrian features of the building. If you have any uh, questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you, Mr. Potts. Um, commission, uh, to my fellow commissioners, any questions? Uh, okay, uh, Commissioner Ambiel, go ahead. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. A um, couple questions, on, one was on the ramp access to the underground parking. What is the slope, what is the degree slope of that ramp? Um, and do you anticipate bikes accessing that or bikes accessing the underground parking via the elevator? Yeah, we typically do not want the bikes accessing the underground parking from the vehicular ramp. I know in the past we've we've uh, treated those ramps with a bit of uh, grit, uh, for lack of a better uh, term, to make it less than enjoyable to ride your bike down the, the ramp should you decide to do so. Um, we would uh, anticipate bikes being accessed through the uh, elevator to the uh, various storage components. Um, the ramp is the, the city's, based on the city's guidelines of slope, it's 10% uh, at the top and the bottom for uh, 10 feet and 20% in between those areas. Um, and as I understand, if you can confirm, you're going to do a surface treatment to make this um, less amenable to wheeled traffic, including skateboards. Did I hear you correctly? Yes, we've done that on uh, some previous projects within the city based on, uh, you know, city request. And, uh, you know, it's obviously safer and better for the project if we keep people off of the ramp that are not in, in vehicles. And do you anticipate uh, residents bringing their bikes to the interior of the building to take them to their units? Um, I, I'm... We prefer that the residents use the uh, bike storage lockers that we're going to provide for them. Um, but that is not to say that some residents with very expensive uh, bikes may still opt um, to take them to their units. We would certainly uh, have CCNRs or something that would allow not allow them to place them on the balconies of, of the units. And remind me again of how many locker units you have total planned. Uh, off the top of my head, I think, I, I believe our, our target here is, is one locker for every unit. Okay. Uh, knowing that some of those units will not use that locker and they may be, you know, um, set aside for other folks. I'll, I'll get an uh, accurate count of that into the set of drawings for you though. Thank you. My, my last question is regarding the stairways um, have you considered adding to your stairways a tray on the side of the stairs so that someone could slip their wheel in for their bike and walk their bike through the stairways 
should the uh, elevators be inaccessible or too crowded. It's something that is common at BART and, and throughout um, public transit where you have a metal tray on which you rest your wheel and you can walk your bike down the stairs. Yeah, I have, uh, I have seen that set up before. At this point, I don't know that um, we've anticipated and or accommodated uh, for that in the width of the stairs and the design of the stairs um, because they're uh, switchback in, in nature. Yes. Um, it, it, would, it would probably still not be the most ideal situation taking your bike up and down. Uh, even though, even if we did have those. So at this point, I would say we, we have not accommodated for that in the overall size of the stair tower. Very good, thank you. Those are my questions. Any other questions from the commission? <clears throat> Commissioner Yang, go ahead. Hi, I was just following up. I had originally the same question um, as Commissioner Ambiel, but the following, following that question, um, I saw in, I think it might have been the staff report, it summarizes under bicycle parking. It says proposed is one class one bike locker sheet and one class two bike rack, but it doesn't, it looks like it's for the whole project. It doesn't specify per how many units or, or a total number of lockers. Yeah. And so. We, clear, we clearly have uh, many more than than one for the <laughs> building, but but I would have, I will go and and make sure there's a a bike parking uh, calculation uh, on the set of plans as we submit them. Um, as you can see here, we have we have several lockers here. We have some freestanding bike racks for short term on that's the lower garage level, and then we uh, have additional freestanding bike racks here and another uh, locker full of uh, of bike lockers, um, which again, the ad was going to be flipped over with the access moved to here. Yeah. Um, okay. We have also contemplated, um, you know, pending the huge amount of uh, utilities and space that, that all the companies require, um, trying to use some of this uh, area here for bike lockers, which makes it, you know, much more convenient, obviously. Um, to get your bikes in and out, you know, either through the hall here at the first level or uh, through here before the ramp starts to go down. Great. And but at this point, we're saving that for uh, utilities and, and things like that. Thank you. And, so, and the second question is not related to the, the bike, um, bicycle, and access, bicycle and access points that you've shown. Um, there was a mention in one of the other documents that specified that related to the traffic impact assessments and whatnot. Um, it said that you're estimating 20 something net new trips. And that seems, I'm not sure that that, I'm, I'm wondering where that calculation came from. If there's 50 units and 111 parking spots. I'm wondering how we got to only 26 trips, uh, if I, that's gonna be addressed. Yeah, it sounded like uh, from what Guido said, there would be a, a traffic impact analysis done on the project. We're, we're still figuring that out, but I, but I don't believe that number came from us. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're not, uh, the, the staff report saying that we're exceeding the VMT threshold of 20 multifamily units and therefore additional v VMT analysis has to be done. That's what okay. we're saying. Okay, got it. All right, that's all for me. Great, Commissioner Schneider. Hi, I was, uh, just, I was looking at the Google Maps and it shows that um, that location, there's a hair salon and a pawn shop there. Um, I was wondering what the impact, if you've done any kind of study on the impact to the street traffic, because Drager's Market is right there also. And if you're gonna be closing down streets or not. Closing down streets during construction or? Yeah, I mean, obviously when it's during construction and how long those be closed off for, for any kind of pedestrians or bicycle or, or vehicle traffic, because Drager's is gonna get a lot of traffic there. 
Yeah, we, we haven't gotten quite that far into it. Um, I would not anticipate any street closures for any long period of time. Uh, the only thing that I could think of there would be some utility connections and things like that. Uh, there, there, it will most likely be a sidewalk closure in front of the project for uh, a period of time during uh, certain phases. Um, typically, uh, further down in the process, we do a construction management plan that outlines, you know, the safety features of that sidewalk closure and time durations and things like that. So no, like sewage typically can, when they again, the lines, that, things will take Yeah, again, there, there may be, there may be a few uh, brief, uh, you know, street closures for uh, utility connections, but I don't anticipate any long-term uh, street closures for a project like this. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair. Uh, yes, thank you. I have um, two questions for Mr. Potts and then I think one question for Guido. Um, my questions, Mr. Potts, one is can you talk us through your EV charging plan? And then the second question is can you talk us through how the garbage and recycling and all that is going to be taken in and out on trash collection days. Yeah, um, the garbage uh, typically, so we have uh, trash being collected on the first level of the uh, underground garage. The garbage, garbage would be taken out um, in a sort of concierge style as they, as they call it. Um, it there'll be a, a cart that pulls the uh, receptacles up to the uh, alleyway there for collection um there'll be a collection area you know some somewhere along the alley here where those carts are placed temporarily um once they're picked up the concierge will return the carts to the uh, garage level uh, for future trash collection uh, we haven't walked through really the eva um, charging uh, layout that we would use um, but we will be meeting you know at a minimum the city and state standards for electrical vehicle charging you're still on you sorry. sorry about that it's okay you're, guido you mentioned a little bit about potential joint session or two with planning commission when these projects come back in application. Um, do you have any more logistics thought to that yet? Or if not, not? Uh, no, I mean, obviously I'd have to coordinate with uh, Jaime and the other engineering staff and then the chair of both uh, commissions. Um, was, was, there, was there a comment or a concern or is there something you want me to address or? I think I think I probably have comments, but our chair might want us to hold those till the comment period. Okay. okay. Any further questions from the commission? I have, I have one question, Nadine. Steve, go ahead. Um, Mr. Potts, was there any contemplation or discussion of where visitors to the residence would park when they're visiting, since the under, I'm guessing that the underground parking is gated and secure. Um, yeah, there is uh, guest parking uh, provided for in the underground parking. At this point, um, we would be providing, uh, as laid out now, there would be 11 guest parking spaces in the underground parking. There would be, uh, you know, either a mobile app to uh, open a gate or a, a box for a guest to punch in a number uh, to open a gate. Um, so there's 11 guest parking spaces there currently, and that's if we don't expand the parking by reducing some spaces to eight and a half feet, um, which is just two spaces below the city standard um, of guests for a, a building of this size. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Um, as, a, as a citizen, I have a question about the electric parking and charging. You, you have your turn. You have your turn. You have your turn, please. Wait. Okay. You didn't say who the question. I said from the commission. Um, so, Mr. 
Well, so maybe that's a question to actually Guido or to Jim, I'm not sure. Um, the parking on the street, on First Street, you know, today I guess it's all um, uncontrolled parking. Correct. Will there be any mechanism by which we can determine uh, what portions of that would be no parking or perhaps dedicated to um, Uber pickups or deliveries or how, how do you think about um, uh, these items in terms of dedicating spaces to deliveries and pickups? Yeah, that's a greater question. I think that, that uh, probably uh, Guido or somebody at, at the engineering level would have to answer. Currently uh, within the city, uh, that street parking is uncontrolled uh, except for a few uh, red zones along uh, First Street. Um, this project frontage will have, you know, a great deal of spaces available on First Street and on Whitney Street at the frontage. Those spaces, I suppose, in theory, are currently used by the existing structures within there, but in reality, they're probably used by folks going across the street to the market or going downtown that didn't want to park in the in the lots um, so it's it's relatively uncontrolled parking um, i would say from an uber pickup or or even a delivery standpoint um, you know it would be you know finding a parking space along the frontage and uh, parking and making that delivery or pickup um, you know uh, in my experience it's it's not terribly can i can usually find a spot along first street but but i can't say that that'll be easy all the time okay i don't believe we have the ability to restrict any of that parking i i would put it that way yeah i understand that maybe that question also i'm going to ask the same question to either guido or to uh, to jim yeah I, I would have to punt to the engineering staff in terms of you know red curb or yellow curb or whatever the designation may be so okay I can take a stab at trying to answer that if you'd like, Jim. This is uh, Jaime Rodriguez in the transportation unit. So we, we have actually started a kind of uh, curb management plan for First Street. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be sure to sh reshare that drawing with Guido in case uh, he, he doesn't have it. Uh, I think it might be something we developed before Guido was here with the city. And, uh, and so the location of where we were envisioning um, uh, red curb zones, loading zones, we kind of started that planning effort about a year ago and knowing that there was some master plan work for future development kind of needed along First Street. So we'd all share those documents with you, uh, you know, in an email. Great, thank you, Jaime. And then I guess uh, along that same thinking, what's the parking situation in the back alleys? Is that restricted parking uh, or will we uh, put some kind of a posted sign that no parking or what's yeah. the so, sorry, uh, yeah, there's no parking in the alley unless it's in a parking lot that is off the alley. Um, the alley's uh, too narrow to have any, any parking allowed. So it's a, it's a no parking zone from end to end currently. And uh, I, I would only imagine that it will maintain that status uh, due to its width. Great, thank you. All right, so with that, I'm going to open that to uh, questions from the public. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, again, there will be no discussion. You can just simply state your thoughts or questions, and we'll take note of it. Please raise your hands and state your name. Okay, Mr. I would to raise my hand on the web version. Yeah, go ahead. I see you. Mr. Eater, go ahead. you got three minutes. I happen to be Chris. Um, okay, I don't see that. Okay, well, go ahead then, Chris. I don't see that, but go ahead. My, my only question was to comment on the number of EV spots. He said he would meet the state and the city regulations, but I don't know what those are. And if someone could just bring that to light, as electric vehicles seem to be the only vehicles GM will produce going forward, I think a building that will last for 20, 30, 50, 100 years should have more foresight. That's my only question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. I also see a request from Mr. Joe Eater. Uh, yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. 
thank you. Well, first, I just want to thank you for opening this to the public. I just learned of your group through an overview presentation Los Altos City did to our community. And um, I just wanted to share as a, I used to commute regularly by bike to my company, Hewlett Packard. And there were times when I got caught working late, you know, and I was still on my bike and had to drive home. So I wanted to share that you mentioned the bike racks, or I think they're in that uh, lower level of the unit, of, uh, of the structure. And uh, it's really important, I think, especially for all, all citizens, but especially women, that you consider maybe some really good lighting around that because you have, to, you, know, you have to bend down to get your chain out or to put your key in and to open the unit, get your bike in, and you're there for a little bit of time. And it makes you perhaps a little bit vulnerable depending on when you're accessing to you know, something happening. Uh, you know. So I just want to be, um, bring to your attention maybe the importance of thinking that piece of it through for ease of use and safety for the community that resides there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any further uh, comments from the... Uh members of the public. All right, I don't see any further requests. So with that, I'm gonna bring it back to the commission for comments and feedback to um, the applicant and to Rito. Uh, let's go ahead and start with the vice chair. Okay, thank you. So just my summary feedback um, for the applicant and Mr. Potts. Number one is bike parking. Appreciate that you're giving more to the spots than the VTA guidelines because those guidelines as you've probably heard us say before are very slim. So I would just make sure you plan for ample bike parking and I would make sure when you're I know that one bike parking spot you're still thinking about is it storage is it placement where is it going to be just make sure that there's no conflict with the vehicles as those bikes are moved around from storage to however they're getting in and out of the garage presumably the elevator. Um, and also please consider the comment of the public speaker about safety and lighting in the bike storage area. The next comment I have is regarding EV charging. Um, the, we haven't had a development project before us in a while. Some of the previous state guidelines on that did not provide a lot of EV charging. So we have asked previous applicants to consider um, providing additional um, setups as well as looking at the infrastructure of their building. And if they don't have set up for every stall, have sort of the things set up to the capability. So that's easily added later versus a big custom retrofit, they become very hard. The next one, appreciate that you're widening the sidewalk. I know we've had uh, other places widened um, that we're working on in First Street. And another comment on the sidewalk, when you do do that construction and you're talking about closing the sidewalk, we one time had a public speaker who was blind and when there was a construction project downtown, they had a lot of trouble around a closed sidewalk. So just make sure you talk with city staff about what the, what the plan can be there. The next thing is um, I look forward to our VMT analysis. You may be the first one, <laughs> one that we see. And then in terms of the TIA, um, one of the the things if it's reasonable for us to request is can we look at other pedestrian safety issues in the area when I looked um, when this project went before the Planning Commission there was written feedback from someone that was saying that there was pedestrian safety issues around this area so if we could just have the study look at that if that's possible city staff um, the next one that I have is um, so because we can retain the LOS policy, even with our transition to VMT, um, I think that's something that this commission has expressed. So, so I just want to reiterate, we're interested in that. So I think as this comes back in the TIA, we would want to see um, LOS data as well, whatever to the maximum is possible. Um, and then in terms of the first street streetscape plan, I know we've never seen the formal plan, but there's always some reference to it. So please consider landscaping. There was also written public comment into the planning commission regarding that and alignment and green. And then I feel that we've kind of had some discussions in the past about a loading zone parking strategy but we've never, for First Street, but we've never really seen anything and possibly in the alleys. So Jaime, that would be really good if we could finally get that um, because these First Street projects keep coming up to us. 
I'm of course concerned about the cumulative impact of parking and um, things being moved onto the roadways if we don't have enough parking in the, in, in the building. Understand that we have city ordinances and state laws that you know, limit how much, par you know, what requirements parking a developer has to provide. So Mr. Potts, thank you for looking to provide, you know, not bare minimum, but something that better supports the building. And the final couple things for us as a commission and staff team, given this new process with the state, especially, we've been talking for, for over a year, a year and a half now about kind of getting a develop a checklist together for developers with our most commonly asked questions. I have a bunch of notes on that. I, I know I went away for a couple months, you know, a, a year and a half ago or something, but let's and i know we're really busy but i think it's really time that we have to do that as more projects will come for, forward to us again and even if we need to get a consultant to help us do it that, because you guys are busy let's do that let's let's just streamline this process for all for all, ourselves and for the applicants and then my final point as we have to do these joint sessions with the planning commission I'd like to understand that logistics better because, Guido, I know you mentioned possibly two joint sessions with the Planning Commission. I'm not sure that's reasonable because usually when we see a project, we only see it once. And I think doing it with the Planning Commission once is going to make a big overhead as well. So I look forward to hearing what my fellow commissioners have to say about ideas around that. But we just need to think through the logistics. So thank you, Mr. Potts, for bringing this project to us. Um, we look forward to seeing you again. Great, thank you, Stacy. Any further comments from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Ambiel, go ahead. Yes, thank you. This looks like a, an exciting project. It certainly is going to bring a lot of housing to the downtown area, which will also bring additional traffic. We know that corridor uh, along First Street is already impacted. The speeds are high. It's not a comfortable place for pedestrians or cyclists to use. So uh, I appreciate that there, uh, the developer will be increasing the width of the sidewalk in front of the structure. I don't know what is planned for Whitney Street. I would also like to suggest that some additional attention be paid to Whitney because if school children will be walking to school, the likelihood will be they will use Whitney and not first. So we could pay attention a little bit to the pedestrian infrastructure along Whitney. I think that would, we would all benefit as a community. And as a community and as a commission and a city, I think it's time that we all sit down and take a more expansive view of the downtown area and the impact of the additional housing and the school children that that housing will bring. We do not have a complete streets master plan, safe routes to school route for the downtown area. And I think this uh, project here sort of tips that scale. And it's time for us as a commission to sit back and think about, and how are we going to do this? And how are we going to make sure that children that live in this triangle don't have to get in a car to get to school? Um, I echo all the comments about EV charging. Um, if there's no EV charging, uh, that's going to be a significant detriment to the future of this building. So I think it would be in their best interest to do as much as you can. And then finally, with regards to bike parking, uh, I know I asked the question about how comfortable are you with residents bringing bikes into their units. Um, uh, one bike per unit is probably insufficient. Uh, Nadine may chuckle, chuckle, I am an outlier. I myself own five bikes just for me. So one bike locker would not be sufficient for my family. I am an outlier, but if there's families living there and mom has a bike, dad has a bike, and the kids have bikes, that's four bikes and you have one bike locker. So I would consider, um, I would ask the, the developer consider the impact of those larger units that may have more than one bike for them. So thank you for your time today. Great, any further comments from the commission? Uh, I have just one. <coughs> Go ahead, Steve. Um, Mr. Potts, thank you for the presentation. You mentioned in passing, that you are making some enhancements to the alley behind the building. Um, and when we meet with our, the joint meeting with the planning commission, I'd like for um, the complete streets commission to maybe think about the way that we could improve the use of the alley in Los Altos. It's really um, 
used mostly by pedestrians and cyclists right now because there's almost no traffic on it. And it goes parallel to First Street and goes almost all the way to Edith by, by uh, I think all the way from um, Whitney to Edith. And I think that um, whatever this development does to improve it might be a precedent moving forward. And I think we should understand that and see if it makes sense to endorse it or not. So that's my only comment. Great, thank you, Steve. Any further comments? Venka, go ahead, Venka Traman. Suresh? Yeah, thank you. Um, in addition to the comments that have been made, I have two, uh, uh, two additional ones. Um, uh, Commissioner Ambiel mentioned uh, looking at the bike and ped and, and uh, the uh, safe routes to school. Um, I think it's it maybe good to do that in parallel now um, to, to understand the impact and how maybe even develop a concept uh, bike and ped um, route to, I believe the schools in this case would be Bullis, Egan, and, and Los Altos High. Um, I guess it's Bullis, I'm not sure. Um, at least the map shows that it's Bullis, Egan. Um, and um, so maybe maybe a concept of what that might look like could help um, uh, plan the surroundings there. Um, in addition, another comment I had was uh, maybe consider, as you're thinking about the landscaping around the area, consider providing some sort of a level two bike rack outside the structure um, um, in case people want to lock the bike for a quick errand or so, so they don't have to take the bike back in. That might be something useful. Great. Any further comments? Can I uh, make a couple comments? Uh, if you're not on the commission, no, you may not. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so uh, let me just close with that final comments here. Uh, I support the narrower stalls for added parking capacity in the, in the parking uh, garage. I fully support the comments on, on enhancing the back alley for a safer um, path for pedestrians and bicyclists. I fully support the comments on the lighting. I also fully support the comments on the bike stalls. Uh, you, get have, you have to expect that with electric bikes, e-bikes, they become, will become more prevalent. So this is having three or four bikes at home is not necessarily a luxury. That probably will become increasingly a reality. And I would certainly encourage the city staff uh, and uh, both aisles, so the engineering and the, on the planning side, to examine uh, the streetscaping, I guess, on First Street and what we can do using this project as a vehicle or precedent to make those improvements. So hopefully that's enough feedback, Guido, and, and for the developer. That is excellent. That is, that's exactly what we wanted, Chair. Um, Great. Yeah. And, um, at the end of this is the last pre-app uh, meeting, so I don't, I don't know what the protocol is, but hopefully we can get um, these comments also in the meeting minutes. And I don't know what your guys' protocol is to to get those adopted, but I, I would want to get those to the applicant uh, quickly so they can formally submit. So. Yeah, usually the minutes don't go into all the details, so hopefully you've captured the notes. This is yes. this meeting is recorded. You may feel free to go back and uh, and then recapture the notes if you need to. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. Great. So with that, let's move on to item number three on the agenda, which is the uh, vision statement of the Complete Streets Master Plan. And Jaime um, or Jim, I'm not sure exactly who wants to go first. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to open us up. Um, so good evening, uh, Chair Malouf and Commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Can, can we really quick just make sure Sam is on board? I've been uh, texting him to uh, jump on. Sam, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hi, Mike. Great. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Jim. Just want to make sure. Not a problem. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, as you know, in early January, the commission expressed concerns about the process or perhaps lack thereof for selecting streets plan for improvement within the complete streets master plan. Uh, and you all indicated in order to make a sound decision in prioritizing the concept plans of the master plan, the 18 corridors. Uh, and also selecting and prioritizing projects going forward, we needed a vision statement, a complete streets vision statement, and also decision-making criteria, including weightings for each 
you know, such as safe routes to school or gap closures and connectivity or linkages to places of interest, those kind of things, safety. And not to mention, thirdly, metrics to measure success uh, of, our, of our work. So uh, time was of the essence, and I know you all chose to pause your work on the master plan until visioning was complete. So uh, staff re responded quickly and sought and received proposals to facilitate this workshop. And we selected Alta based on their experience, their availability, and their intimate understanding of Los Altos with uh, the work they're doing and prior work they've, doing, they've been doing. So uh, yeah, tonight, Sam Corbett of Alta will be our facilitator, and he is backed up by project manager Jeff Knowles and uh, work supported by Courtney Banker of their team. Um, you will have your work cut out for you because here on after, uh, yeah, there's a lot of work for you to review. The project team, uh, Alta Traffic Patterns, and staff have been working full steam ahead. And we have deliverables uh, that are, are kind of stacking up. So um, it's exciting, but um, and before I actually hand it over to Sam, I noticed that the city's new fearless leader is listening in, and I'd like to quickly introduce him, and that's interim city manager, Brad Kilger. Uh, Brad, could you introduce yourself, please? You're on mute, Brad. Excuse my uh, tardiness and my um, uh, relaxed appearance. Uh, last night's council meeting went quite late if anybody was tracking it but uh, with that said um, <clears throat> I've been tracking what you have been doing um, uh, the work of this commission is extremely important for the future of uh, Los Altos and uh, I really appreciate the time that you're putting into this um, it's volunteers I have to always say a story that I always liked I was working with a planning commission in one of my communities and they were in their like oh, 30th or 40th meeting uh, on their general plan uh, development, the revision of the general plan. And finally, they were very tired. And the chairman, who I really liked, came in and started throwing bags of peanuts around to the various commissioners and said, well, just want you to know you're working for peanuts. And I wanted to recognize that to, for each of you. With that little uh, uh, poor attempted uh, humor, uh, I did want to really emphasize that um, people don't always recognize that you're, you're giving your time and uh, you're busy, you have jobs, and you're doing other things. So <clears throat> I've always put a lot of stake in the work that the commissions do, particularly now that you're moving on to your vision goals and performance for the Complete Streets Master Plan. Because a lot of people talk about master plans being put on shelves and forgotten. The one thing I like about Los Altos is they really use them and they develop them into their, uh, uh, their long-term programs. Last comment is what we worked on, one of the things we worked on last night was the council's visions and goals for the coming five years and objectives for the next two to three years. And they place transportation very high on that list. So please continue the work you're doing. I know you will. And uh, I really enjoyed the workshop earlier. I sat in through that and uh, uh, quite an engaged community. And you've got your hands full with a lot of people with a lot of issues uh, that you have to deal with. So I'll stop there, but thank you very much for all the work you're doing and I'm finding it very interesting. Great, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Jim. And, and Brad, I'll take advice on how I can distribute virtual peanuts. Yeah, I know, I hear that. And trust me, before we're done, you'll be able to do it. Great. All right. Uh, I guess, uh, Jim, uh, it's Jaime's turn now? Yeah, uh, it's actually Sam's turn. Go ahead and take it away, Sam. Very well. Great. Hello, Sam and the Alta team. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Corbett. I'm a principal with Alta Planning and Design. And as Jim mentioned, I'll be facilitating this evening's uh, visioning workshop on, uh, as, as Jim noted, the uh, really setting a vision for complete streets in Los Altos, as well as agreeing uh, different uh, performance and prioritization criteria and performance measures to support those. 
Uh, we are going to keep this quite interactive and uh, we'll be using poll everywhere to poll uh, all of the participants. Uh, so at a certain point, I'll ask each of you to log in to poll everywhere and solicit your feedback and input on uh, various topics, notably the vision statement itself, uh, different uh, project prioritization criteria that we're proposing, and then lastly, performance measures uh, that we'll uh, ultimately use to uh, evaluate uh, the success of the Complete Streets Master Plan. So this is our agenda. Uh, we'll start off just reviewing some precedent images of Complete Streets uh, from around the region and the country. Um, review um, some of the key policy documents and goals in, in Los Altos as well as other cities uh, for sort of inspiration and examples of what uh, could be a vision statement for complete streets in Los Altos. Um, then we'll move into the project prioritization and performance measurement section. Okay, so just starting off with a few precedent images, I'll go through this pretty quickly. I think probably most of you in this session are familiar with complete streets, but it's really about you know, planning streets for all users. Uh, and here we go. So here's an example from Lincoln, Nebraska. They put in a, a separated bikeway um, that provides a more comfortable, um, safer, better connected facility for cyclists. Also separates out the uh, pedestrians from vehicle traffic, reduces speeds. Um, another photo of that facility. Um, here's a photo from Memphis, Tennessee. Also, transit's a key element too. Obviously, it's complete street. And so this is, um, you know, no no curb line. Obviously, a slow street environment. Sometimes there's uh, rail transit. This is just a rubber tire trolley, um, but also just sort of a more conducive uh, slow street environment um, that's better for cyclists, better for pedestrians. And then nearby in Los, Gal Los Galtos, this is um, a, a road diet that went in to provide uh, also separated cycleway. Um, and you can see that we show a couple different images. This one on Boston Hill Road that you can see the before image in which there were many more lanes of traffic, higher speed environment, and then reduced down to really just one lane of traffic in each direction with the uh, separated cycleway on each side of the road. So yeah, those, those are just some images to sort of get people thinking about the concept of complete streets. And now we wanna just start to explore some of the vision statements and goals, um, starting off with uh, local um, examples of policy documents from the general plan and, and some of the existing plans in Los Altos. So not sure if you've reviewed it yet, but we've completed the existing conditions report for the complete streets plan. Um, key findings have been that um, while bicycling is a viable transportation option in the city, um, level of comfort and collision rates are um, not uh, ideal or where we would like them to be. Um, so there is, there are good networks for both pedestrians and cyclists, but not at the sort of level of comfort that we aspire to for really ideal complete streets and, and optimal conditions. Um, so you see we note a few corridors where there are um, higher than um, expected bicycle collisions around uh, as well as pedestrian collisions in and around the downtown and some of the major commercial districts. In the general plan, the circulation element from 2002, it talks about reducing the amount of uh, slowing and reducing the amount of traffic in residential neighborhoods and near schools um, and providing for pedestrians and cyclists so that they can safely and quickly move about the community. Um, there are also a number of goals related. Uh, providing uh, for uh, transit dependent individuals, uh, providing safe uh, bicycle pedestrian facilities, 
both for commuter as well as recreation purposes. And then um, lastly, providing parking around residential neighborhoods, but not encouraging, overly encouraging the, the use of the automobile travel. And then uh, the most recent bicycle transportation plan for 2012 also provides uh, you know, the overarching goal of providing uh, you know, safe facilities for all cyclists to be able to ride. And then there's a number of supporting goals uh, related to uh, you know, utilitarian recreational trips, um, access to schools, other end of trip facilities, could be transit uh, stations, et cetera. And then also providing more for that recreational bicycling. Um, or we also are aware of you know, a climate action plan or in the process of updating it as well. Um, there, it was you know, a goal, a target had been set of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 15% from the baseline, of, which was 2005. Um, so this, I think, is also a key element to, to consider uh, in the development of a vision statement for the uh, for complete streets in Los Altos. And then lastly, uh, your pedestrian master plan from 2015. Um, this one is kind of quite a mouthful, but I think that the gist of it is that you're providing a walkable city for really all ages and abilities, and that it's connecting to sort of key destinations, downtown, schools, parks, transit services, etc. And that you're doing that really for all, all many purposes. And then there's also supporting goals in the pedestrian master plan. Um, you know, routinely providing pedestrian accommodation, um, really serving people of all age and, ages and abilities. I think that's a key point. Um, focusing on safe, convenient uh, access, connecting to transit in neighboring communities, uh, Improving ped safety, reducing risk factors, uh, vehicle speeds, crossing distance conflict points, and then lastly, increasing pedestrian mode share. So those those are kind of some of the key uh, internal uh, Los Altos documents. Wanted to briefly explore a couple other communities so that you're aware of what sort of vision and policy approach they take for completed streets. Um, so this is from Sunnyvale, uh, from their active transportation plan, which was just completed uh, last year. Uh, and they say that it's a complete streets community where residents, commuters have the choice to bicycle and walk to meet their transportation needs on a connected, comfortable, and convenient network designed for all ages and abilities. Another example, this is more of a regional approach and it's actually a guidebook that's intended to inspire and provide resources for all communities and sort of moderate the area. And so this can be adopted by different jurisdictions. And they also talk about the safe, balanced, environmentally sensitive multimodal transportation system. Um, so one, another example, and also sort of touch on that all ages and abilities. Should be accessible, heads, bicyclists, children, seniors, persons with disabilities, etc. Uh, this one's quite simple, um, short and succinct from Phoenix. Um, they, they articulate that Phoenix streets are designed and maintained to be safe, accessible, convenient, and comfortable for all ages and abilities and transportation modes at all times. So it also, you know, sort of covers that temporal issue um, as well. Uh, another example from Burbank, um, this one, they're, they're um, complete our streets. Um, they have an overarching notion that everyone, people walking, taking transit, bicycling, driving, and all others should be able to use streets safely. And then they support it with kind of six six goals or six sort of, you know, supporting um, uh, notions, uh, objectives, you might call them, um, relating from uh, you know, com complete networks for all transportation modes to 
um, health, fostering a healthier city, um, making it an inclusive city, so bringing in equity, uh, also shade and shelter, you know, noting that, that our cities are becoming hotter and as a, particularly as a pedestrian or cyclist, you're exposed to the elements more. So thinking about shade and, and shelter is really important. Um, in San Mateo County, they recently adopted their Sustainable Streets Master Plan. Um, and this, you know, as you can tell from the title, a lot of it is about sustainability, green infrastructure. Um, they talk about there's sort of a number of goals supporting or objectives supporting the overarching vision, uh, many of which relate to uh, climate change impacts. So they have, um, they talk about expanding treatment of roadway runoff using green infrastructure to achieve water quality improvements, uh, reducing carbon emissions through supporting sustainable modes of transportation. Um, adapting the transportation network to better address rainfall and heat-related climate change impacts. Uh, and there's a couple others too related to sort of habitat or um, PhD impacts. And then one last example. I want to be sorry, comfortable uh, again because one day not, after the, all that stuff didn't even come in. Yourself. There was too much going on. Can, like, can someone um, has, mute their mic there? I'm getting some funny. other can audio there. there. Great, thank you. Uh, so just two, two plans I wanted to highlight from San Jose. Uh, one is their complete streets design standards and guidelines from 2018. Really three key pillars to this. Uh, one about sort of people, that streets should be people oriented. Another about sort of the connectivity of that streets provide us and how that's an important core function of streets. And then lastly, again, sort of this green streets notion and the uh, resiliency of streets and how they can really help with uh, climate change impacts and adverse impacts related to transportation. And then the other plan is actually, that's a plan that's underway, it's their access and mobility plan, um, but there are a number of complete streets uh, objectives and goals that are articulated in, in this draft document uh, related to uh, access for all, um, transportation happiness. But this was an interesting notion that isn't always captured in plans and sort of making, making the transportation network easy and enjoyable and appealing. 20-minute um, neighborhoods, sort of creating areas that you can get around and you can run errands uh, within 20 minutes without having to get in your car. But it's still really making places accessible. And uh, also sort of planning for the future and being flexible, not knowing exactly what you know future transportation options will look like. So that's kind of a summary. There were six different uh, different what we want to do is we want to have all of you um, vote on which, your, which of those six plans resonated with you the most. So um, if you could go to, we're going to chat this in, but it seems like the chat function isn't enabled. So if you could just go to this site here, um, Paul, if- I can, en I can enable the chat if you- Oh, can you? Okay, yeah, if you can enable the chat, we can, uh, Courtney can chat out the link to everyone and you can just click on it. <coughs> um, if none of them resonate, how do we respond? If none of them resonate, um, you can probably just abstain, abstain from this one. I'll just give us a few more seconds. Are people able are people able to log in or so far it looks like we're only Do you might just flip 
Do you mind just flipping through them real quick? Uh, as oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Right. I remember them. Yeah, so um, starting with Sunnyvale, um, this was just complete streets for, I'll let you read it. Uh, Monterey Bay, this was a guidebook. Uh, it's, you know, not an official document, but it's really just providing resources and, and you know, toolkits, materials for other jurisdictions to adopt the language. Phoenix here, short and sweet, all ages and abilities at all times. Uh, Burbank, um, everyone should be able to use streets safely, and then these 10 sort of supporting objectives. Uh, San Mateo County Sustainable Streets Master Plan. And then, and then San Jose is actually two different documents that I shared here, one being the complete streets design standards, and then the other being this access and mobility plan, which is currently underway. Is the, is the site working for people? Let me know if you're having any technical issues getting in there. It appears that Steve has voted in chat, not <laughs> at the site. Okay, maybe, Cormie, if you get votes in chat, can you put them into poll everywhere? And, and I was, yep, if you could have a little discussion for people that voted, it looks like right now we've got a couple different votes for Burbank and San Jose. What did, what did people like about those ones? What, what was it about those vision statements or, or goals that resonated with you? Um, if I may, for me, San Jose resonated because it had three clear um, higher order goals and objectives they were trying to strive for. I don't necessarily agree that those are our three, but I liked the fact that they had three pillars that they were seeking to solve for. Uh, a list of 12 seems to be a little distracted. So, you know, if we think about Los Altos, I think about instead of maybe people oriented, I think about neighborly. I think about um, community first. And I think about safety as our three pillars. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's helpful. And that's actually, that's great to, what we're, that's about what we're going to get into. But uh, there's just a little more discussion on why people voted for the other ones. What about Burbank? What was it about that one that resonated with people? Stacey, I think you, you raise your hand. Go ahead. No, no, that's okay. I had three bullets to propose, but I heard Sam. Oh, uh, no, yeah, I think let's, let's, let's answer I Sam's see. questions for the time being. If you have any input to Sam, as to how you voted. I took my hand for. down. I heard it. Yeah, I voted for uh, Burbank, uh, Sam. I don't know who else did, but I'll give you my quick thoughts. Mm -hmm. I like the, the, the fact that they broke it down into six or whatever, five or six very tangible mission points or goals, you know, connectivity. So I think the, the notion of bringing it down to something that the commission and the residents can, can relate to quickly. Uh, I mean, for example, people-oriented, I love the statement, but I'm not sure exactly what it means to me. It's sort of too vague. Uh, and some more specificity in, in where we want to head uh, is what made me uh, vote for Burbank. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll add to that. I also voted for Burbank, but I actually, in my mind, the last three were all pretty similar, uh, Burbank, San Mateo, and San Jose. Um, what I liked about them is that there was – kind of a simple expression of what is the priority or what do they focus on? They took different approaches. So San Mateo used these full, these three different sections, um, Sam, sorry, San Jose, and then San Mateo had a focus on sustainability. Um, and then Burbank kind of just also kind of highlighted it in the first sentence. Um, I didn't, I don't think we need to have like the 10, or 12, however many supporting goals. Um, but I did like how San Jose, maybe not as the main vision statement, but um, kind of clarified what are the, what are, 
what are the lenses through which they're thinking about transportation and walking and how they're solving for things um, on, the, on that next slide. So these are kind of you know, different angles for how we're thinking about our transportation. I don't know if I agree with all of them that are the same. I think the same comment to Stace um, that Am Commissioner Ambulin made, um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with the exact same bullets or points that they used in these examples, but I like the format of them. Any, any other uh, final thoughts on any of these vision statements or supporting goals for Complete Streets before we move on to... Rush. Go ahead. Yeah, I also had, um, I also liked uh, the way San Mateo and San Jose uh, laid out their vision. Um, I thought that some of the other ones were too, too vague, uh, even the Burbank ones, um, although they have a list, it's a little, little vague, um, maybe too, uh, too high level. The other ones, they had a vision and then they broke it down into what are the key, key aspects that are actionable. Um, San Jose had a nice succinct uh, three-point plan and then, then further broke that into a bunch of you know things that they want that probably drive their projects and so on. Um, San Mateo obviously had a sustainable theme to that entire plan, um, but I, I see that uh, if you kind of step back, I see that uh, San Jose and San Mateo are trying to achieve the same sort of goals and vision. So it, uh, reading through them, um, the clarity of what they're trying to achieve is apparent. Okay. Any, any other final thoughts before we move into actually crafting your own vision statement? Suzanne. Yeah, uh, final thought. One thing that has percolated in my mind for the past few years is what, what is the overarching um, ethos that guides us in our decision making? Is it a vision zero type of program that says we want to see incidents and accidents go to zero? Or is it something more akin to the 880 principles that we want to design our streets such that anybody from the age of eight to 80 is comfortable traversing our network of streets? You know, I'm wondering if there is some other sort of higher ethos that guides us in our decision-making. And the other thing I'm gonna throw in here is a little bit of a wrench. The word complete means complete. It means all users. And to date, what I've seen is this vision statements that really address two modes of transit, which is by foot or by bicycle. And it does very little to address the other aspects of transit that we're most familiar with and we are optimized for, which is single occupancy, single occupancy vehicles and, and transit. So I just want to be, I want to raise that and say a complete streets is a complete street. So I know we're going to be retrofitting many of our streets to accommodate different, different modes, but we do need to have our minds open to that, that the nature of complete. Thank you. Now, Sam, I actually do have one question. You've got six benchmarks that you've shown us. Um, to, to what extent we can gauge the success of any one of them? How, how do we know that the vision statements that were listed there were really productive at the end of the day versus the mm. I spy in the sky stuff? Yeah, great question. And we're actually gonna to get to that. So we have a whole section on uh, performance measurement and sort of tracking goals. And so can, can you hold that for a few Absolutely. minutes and we'll get to that uh, in, in the, actually the last mm -hmm. section of the workshop. Okay, fair enough. I have, a, I have a question for Sam and for perhaps other commission members. Um, the reason I chose Sunnyvale was because there weren't any goals at all. Um, and the reason I did that was because I was thinking that in Los Altos, um, we have a great small city, but it is a small city and it's got a constrained budget and we know what we can and cannot accomplish based on what we've done in the past. At least we have a sense of it. So I thought that the goals that we choose need to be very specific to us and maybe different from all the ones that we've seen, which are much bigger cities, every single one of them. And that I don't know whether you can have more than three goals uh, for a city our size and actually be able to manage to those goals. And I'd like to get some feedback as to, you know, in a vision statement that you actually want to accomplish over a reasonable time frame. You know, um, 
do you want to really constrain yourself in terms of the goals so that you can measure those goals and actually make real progress against them? I think that's probably, if there are no other comments, I'm going to suggest we move on to the next section. It's a good yep. segue to get into the vision statement uh, for Los Altos. Um, so what this is, uh, this is just a write-in. Uh, so essentially, if you want to take a few minutes and just write in to uh, Poll Everywhere, you should have a text box now, um, what your vision is. And you can keep it short. You can, you can write a full paragraph, leave it up to you to sort of craft um, what you think the vision should be for complete streets in most autos. And I should note that once you, you know, you respond to this, we'll start to see uh, what you've typed in and we'll also be able to vote and kind of respond kind of like a, a vision that all of you have shared. And I should mention too that sort of through this, uh, polling software, we're able to capture all the feedback here. So we'll have a record and we'll be able to use all of this for compiling and, and pulling together the, the ultimate vision statement. And uh, Courtney, do you want to do you want to explain the voting function on this? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sam. And hello, everyone. Um, so as you see, the results start to populate on your web page. Um, there should be a thumbs up and a thumbs down option. So if there's one that really resonates with you, you could give it a thumbs up and um, vice versa for the thumbs down. Hey guys, I'm going to say something. Those first two ones in there are me because I'm trying to do a one, two, three and I, it, the enter isn't working. So I'm just going to have to type them in all like a text line so you can delete the first things that I entered. So it's a one, one, two, three, sort of like pillars, kind of similar to what Yeah, I was going to do a one, had. two, three and then when I hit enter, it, it's right, just right, right. making okay. it a yeah, response. Tech. Well, we'll We'll get all the data here and we'll work with it. Okay.
Just so far, I'm, I'm seeing about eight responses. I'm still hearing some typing now. I assume people are still working on submissions. It looks like a few of them have been voted up. So we have this one here at the top on community focused sustainable streets that facilitate safe connected transportation for all modes of transportation by residents of all ages. And if anyone's not able to get Poll Everywhere to work and you want to submit it in the chat, I can submit it on the Poll Everywhere page so that folks can vote. I'll read, I'll read this. I think you can all probably see this, but this just cut off at least on the presentation. Um, this notion of all ages and abilities and a focus on safety, school children, and local transit over commute and cut through traffic. So this one has been voted up here to the top two. So a statement that would encompass three key objectives, safety, connectivity, and usability for all three main modalities, uh, pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicle. Are, are, are people still working on this or should we sort of wrap up and sort of debrief on the vision statements. I don't see many votes in there, so folks need to actually stop typing and vote, I suppose, right? Yeah, there are. There's only one that's been voted, looks like up to two. Yeah. Can I just say, so I, so I was trying to do a one, two, three, and it just hasn't worked in there, so I'm gonna try to put mine in the chat. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've put it in there, but I run out of character space and then I hit the return the first time. I'm sorry to be the who failed the tech challenge today. Is yours the one that's safe, the, the 880, ADA, and then there's the, one that's sustainable? The sustainable, and the third one is connected, and then I didn't, I ran out of space, so it goes into the next. And then connected. Yeah. Okay. Courtney, are you able to consolidate that all into one vision statement? Um, I can try, but I think what Stacey's saying is maybe there's a character limit and um, yeah, so if you just want to add it to the chat, that's probably the best way. Okay. So yeah, why don't we, if everyone's finished putting their vision statements in, why don't we put uh, pencils down and then just everyone will vote on which of these um, most resonates with you and that you support the most or, or don't support because you can, you can thumbs up or thumbs down. Can I, can, can anybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, my, my challenge is that I think there are pieces of multiples that could be combined together for a really good vision statement and that voting on one over all the others to me leaves stuff out. And so I think there's a process question here as to do we want to exclude things by trying to find the most popular single statement or is there a process that would um, gather together key things from some of them that might be more comprehensive and more what we would want it to be mm -hmm. yeah and we can also just have a, a discussion about it so we can get into the details if, 
if there are certain elements of some of these vision statements that really resonate with you, but you still feel like they're missing another attribute or component that you think is really important, we can we can create a hybrid or modify them to make sure that it, it there is consensus and it meets all of your needs and, and your vision for uh, complete streets in Los Altos. Maybe you take the one with the highest votes and then see what people might want to add to it. Right. I mean, so far it looks like this one about the key objectives of safety, um, usability. Why, why, is I, why am I missing? Oh, I'm sorry, safety, connectivity, and usability for all three modes. That one is getting the most votes. What, what's, I guess, what's missing from that one um, that people would like us to add or also, of course, we also can, we haven't gotten into the goals yet, but we saw from some of the other examples that there was often an overarching vision statement and supported by either goals or objectives beneath it. So that's also an option. Oh, sorry, I think I jumped ahead. I put three kind of vision things plus some sub goals below it that were just kind of rough things. So in terms of your question, Sam, safety, connectivity, usability, I generally like those. I don't know who proposed it. I'm wondering what, if anyone else feels that it's a sustainability um, element is missing, like getting people out of cars, getting them walking and biking, making healthy communities, maybe doing green infrastructure, possibly going as far as transit, not that we're doing anything on transit this year or next year, but. Yeah, I, oh, sorry, I know if we're doing this free form, but uh, I also, so I also put the word sustainable in one of them, and part of it was to address the things that um, Stacy just adjust, addressed, and then the other part was, it was also meant to kind of imply a little bit future proofing and long term planning um, so that we're not just solving for today. I think what's what's missing for me in some of these is what we've heard today and in weeks and months prior is that anything we we propose or implement in this city must be community first and neighbor friendly. There's a there's a heightened degree of sensitivity towards what you're doing on my street in front of my house to my world. And so I think we need to be super sensitive to finding solutions that are context appropriate for the community in which we live and put that community first over others. So I think neighborhood and community needs to be in, in the statement um, <clears throat> because as we know, even, even a crosswalk can be controversial, which is kind of alarming, but, but true. Um, I think that for me, um, when you make the streets welcome to all, uh, sustainability is an outcome thereof, although perhaps we need to be a little more directive about that than, than let it happen. So again, I, would, I, would, I want us to make sure we're leaning in into the community uh, forward, community first, and neighborly aspects of any solutions we propose. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to build on, on that comment from um, Suzanne. I think if we look at the challenges that we've had as a city, as a commission in the last couple of years, they probably go in a couple of buckets. The first one is obviously speed, which is really related to safety. Um, we hear that over and over and over. Uh, also, it ties to the safety of the children. So safety kind of is a commonality in terms of uh, pedestrian safety and speed and what have you, different aspects of that one. The second uh, bucket is around the usability and balance. You know, we've had issues on Almond where people thought, I don't want to lose my parking spot. The hell with the bicyclists. I mean, not quite in those words, but they can find their own way to, to, get, to, to, to get to school. Uh, Covington, same story. Uh, Miramont, the same story. So how do you get the various stakeholders on the street to agree on a balance? How do you get the pedestrians and the bike?
And, and we're starting to hear also from people that, that drive cars that say we are too bike and ped focused. We are a complete streets commission. Why aren't you talking about vehicular traffic? So I'll just throw that out there. I don't really feel like the, the top three are in conflict with each other. I think there's a way to work in everything we've said into one. It, assuming we want all of those elements. If there's if there's something that we don't need to include, we can also talk about that. And I think also we need to do a sanity check as we look at the statements. What is it that we can accomplish? What's within reach? <laughs> I mean, you look at San Jose statements, of course it's a, it's a very wealthy and healthy list of, of items to do in there, but San Jose is also way bigger than we are. And, and so they have different uh, different challenges to deal with. So I think we need to scale that statement to what Los Altos is and, and will be. I would agree with that comment about these top ones being um, consistent and compatible with each other. And this has also been really helpful though to have this discussion about other things that we need to make sure that we're capturing in the vision statement and supporting objectives and goals. Um, so what we can do is we can kind of after this workshop, we can kind of wordsmith. I, I find that wordsmithing the vision statement in a workshop is probably not the highest and best use of everyone's time, but we can craft it together. But I guess before I leave this though, I'd want to open it up to, uh, if there are any other key um, concepts or issues that, that commissioners think we also need to incorporate in other than what we've already discussed. I want to ask you one, you mentioned wordsmithing. I want to make sure that we don't lose clarity. Often when mm -hmm. I find wordsmithing, the clarity is diluted, if not lost. I want to make sure that someone who just comes in, lands from Mars and reads our vision statements and they'll get it quickly. And, and that they'll get it and they'll look at what we've decided to do and go, yeah, that makes sense. Right. That they connect and they line up. And there's no question or doubt, oh, why did you do that if that's your goal, right? They should be coherent. And the other thing I want to make sure is that it's not so fluffy worded. I'm in marketing, so I know how to do that. Um, but I want it to be, be crisp and clear so that it, it is measurable, that you can tie things back to it. You can ladder up and ladder down and know exactly what's going on, that we can retreat to this mission statement whenever we need to make a choice. Does A or B better support that goal, that mission, that vision? Can we tell? And we've got a good vision or mission statement. If we can't tell, maybe it's not clear enough. Yeah, and along those lines, I think um, the asset test is gonna be quantification. Can you quantify your vision here? Can you, or is this gonna be some uh, nice sort of <laughs> a vague thing that would make everybody happy, but it can't, it can't be measured. Um, you know, like safety, you know, we should think hard about how do we measure safety? If we're going to put a statement in there, what does it really mean? We're going to reduce incidents. What does it really mean safety? Yeah. We need to think hard about those statements. Yeah. And I, I think that's why um, the model that San Jose used where like we have this, this vision statement that's clear and succinct, um, but then they broke out kind of what are the objectives that support that vision, and then there was more detail. And that's where um, I think where vice chair was putting in some points. Um, those things are probably measure more measurable and going in the right direction. Yeah, which is but back to that quantification is why I don't feel that sustainability. While I love the goal of sustainability. I'm not sure how we as Los Altos are going to measure sustainability. Are we going to somehow put goals for greenhouse emissions and how many cars are going to be on the streets? Or that, that I, I'm having a difficult time connecting that to a tangible metric. And, and we're about to get into that. As soon as we sort of get through this, we're going to get into actual, um, prior, first we're going to discuss prioritization um, measures and then we're going to discuss actual performance measures like how do you how do you define success and how can you evaluate whether you're actually accomplishing the goals 
that we set out for the you know, complete streets plan. And I'd love those metrics to be durable metrics. Mm -hmm. Not come back in two years and sort of say, ah, oh, well, the world has changed. Let's just ditch it. Suresh. Um, yeah, so I think I have a, a comment on, on the vision statement and maybe separate it out from the missions and objective. Um, I, the way I, I, I envision this vision statement is uh, to look ahead and see what, what we would like to see from, what would we like this community to be like? Um, and it's important to sell that vision statement and get buy-in from the, from, the, from the city and, and the community because then it makes the rest of our projects as we go through um, easier to handle. I mean, things like, you know, parking for the houses and so on. If the city and, the, and everybody buys into that vision statement. So, I, you know, um, I agree that uh, things like safety and connectivity are, are, are parts of it, but I'm not sure something here communicates what we envision this, the streets to look like. That is, what is, what, what is it that we want the streets to do for the people? Right? And I think um, you know, saying something about what we wanted that to look like is important. Um, something like, you know, if, although it may seem that it's, it's sort of um, uh, pie in the sky, but saying that we want to uh, tie every part of the community together by all modes of trans transportation. And that you also gives you some sort of a measurable aspect later saying, yeah, you know, biking is, you know, you can bike from here to here, here to here is not safe and so on. So having a vision saying every part of the community or every part of the city will be connected is sort of a vision statement um, or some sort, some, or some form of that kind of a statement is to say, okay, what do we, what, what, what do we see the city look like? Hmm. And as, so as, as part of it being more specific, like I know some of the vision statements talked about all streets or at all times, or, or some are more, maybe more specific about certain parts of the city. Is that, is that kind of what you're, you're yeah, so, writing so let's for? Say, let's say we're writing this plan for the next 10 years. At the end of the 10 years, what do we want this to look like? Although it's a dynamic plan, we understand we have to adapt to it, but I think we should envision at the end of the 10 years, what is it that we want to see? Um, you know, if, if it means that every student, every kid needs to be by, be able to bike to, uh, you know, to a three or a four or five mile radius. Um, so there is a way to connect every part of the city to every accessible need for that particular community. It's is important. For example, if somebody lives in a house, they should be able to go to the downtown or, or a commercial area or a, uh, a school, um, and so on. And you want to be able to fully connect it. And I think that's sort of a vision, this is a vision statement. I guess I'm, I'm trying to advocate for. Um, we could drill this down further saying, of course, sustainability is an aspect of it. And one way to measure that might be to say that it'll support or fully accomplish the climate action goals of the city. Um, uh, things like um, uh, safety could be tied to some sort of a safety measure as part of the, uh, the state's master plan and the vision that we're, the, or the exercise that Alta is doing now. Um, but stepping back, I think it's important for her to say something about us, um, you, you know, what, how, how we envision this or what we see at the end of the exercise, at the end of the Okay, plan. great. Any other final thoughts? I'm, I, I guess I'm gonna, we have two more sections to get through. So in the interest of time, unless there are sort of any other um, thoughts or things that you wanna make sure we fold in to the vision statement, I'm gonna propose we move on. Yep. And, and I guess one other thing I can say, is, I, I, we won't, the, the vision statement we craft up is obviously not the be all and end all. So we'll see, we might even give you a few more options in our, in our memo that we draft from this session. So there will still be more discussion and dialogue. So, okay, move on to this next section. So as I mentioned, uh, we will be prioritizing uh, all of the projects that come out of the complete streets plan. And wanted to just talk a little bit about prioritization. Um, first, starting with what you've used in the past for prioritization. So from your bike plan, um, there were really just a few different categories having to do with um, kind of suggested routes to school, uh, connecting to destinations, um, safety. 
So really, if, if a corridor was had a higher number of collisions, it was prioritized higher. Um, and then connectivity and then uh, support, kind of community support. Um, in the Ted Master Plan, um, there was a number of different factors that went into prioritization. Uh, it was a, a Ted suitability index, again, uh, public support, safety. So if there was sort of a known safety issue, uh, that was flagged and that would have to do with the ranking of projects. Um, sort of feasibility issues, right of way, parking impact, um, gap closure, that if it was a sort of a key gap in the network, that then received higher prioritization. And then also other destinations, schools, parks, community centers. Um, some examples from other communities. Uh, so in Sunnyvale, we talked about this earlier, their active transportation plan. They also have some typical things like collision, um, they looked at an equity factor, which was um, disadvantaged communities, communities of concern. Um, again, de destinations focusing on you know, transit facilities, libraries, other community centers, uh, community need. And then they also looked at their low stress network. And if it was really contributing to providing a low stress bicycle network, it was prioritized. Uh, in Burbank, a lot of the same factors, uh, they brought in some planning costs, which might be sort of different here. They also considered uh, operations and maintenance, which sometimes isn't considered um, sort of factoring in the whole life cycle of the project, not just the initial capital costs. Uh, San Mateo, uh, there was a whole thing on, uh, as you can imagine, since it was a sustainable streets plan, the whole factor on the kind of sustainability, green streets, you know, the runoff factors. So some very technical elements having to do with that. Um, I think the other thing that was interesting here was tree canopy. Um, so they considered tree canopy in, in the prioritization, uh, presumably uh, if it was an area with lower tree canopy, it was re received higher priority. I'm, I'm working on a project right now in Mountain View where we're doing something similar and really trying to increase Mm -hmm. um, that's the pavement condition index. Pavement plan can be a good way also of delivering complete mm -hmm. streets projects at fairly low cost. So that the paving plan can be a really good factor to consider in prioritization. Um, so anyhow, we, this is just a sample prioritization criteria that we've drafted sort of for your review and consideration. I should say this is really just a starting point and what our next exercise is for you to sort of rank. I wouldn't focus too much on the measures. The, the measures will um, can be any number of factors and we can adjust them to capture the overall category. And of course, a lot of the, the measures themselves are contingent and dependent upon data availability and making sure that like Los Altos has this data and we can evaluate it on a citywide level. Um, but there's, there's basically, I think we have eight different categories from safety, um, one being sort of more safe routes to school, the other being collision reduction. And then we have connectivity, comfort, access to key destinations, community identified need, equity, uh, climate impacts, and then, like I said, there's a number of different measures that can be used to evaluate those. And this next exercise is also a poll everywhere. So essentially, if you just go into poll everywhere and, and on this exercise, it's a ranking. So you're, you're able to toggle the, it, the ones that you think are most important. If you can move those up to the top of your screen, that will then you know, basically say, if you think equity, for instance, is most important, put that up to the top and have a relative ranking from top to bottom for the criteria. If I may, uh, when we think about equity, uh, given that Los Altos has, uh, does not have, I think, disadvantaged populations that other communities might have, when we talk about equity, we, in some cases, we, need, we mean balance and geographic equity. There tends to be a great deal of focus and investment and energy on the downtown aspects, North Los Altos, if you will, 
versus South Los Altos. So I think we need to think from a geographic equity, are we distributing the projects and investments and attention appropriately? The needs are similar, but the attention is very different. And I think uh, Vice Chair Banerjee can speak to some of that more adequately than I. I, I think that's a fair comment and uh, that that's consistent with the definition of equity too is geographic distribution. So I think that that can even be a, a one of the measures that is used to capture equity. Any questions on the ranking? Is that working for everybody? Um, I had one question. I actually appreciate Suzanne that you raised equity because I, I was thinking this. The, no, I I didn't even have geographic equity on my mind, so I'm glad you said that because it usually is on my mind. Um, but I also agree that you know when countywide when we rank for geographic equity, Los Altos kind of gets a score zero. So so I, I think we do have to think of what we mean by there. And if geographic is the one, I'm all for it. The other point that I had is, is I see safety and collision reduction ranking really high. I just, it's, I, I certainly think it's important, but I think when you go look in the metrics, when we pull up metrics, we see a lot of our collisions, they're just along the expressway, they're all along San Antonio and they're along El Camino. So the question for the team is, like, is that where we want to, it, 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 it it sounds good, but when we look at the data, is this really where we want to have our number two? And I'll, let me add to that. There's also a lot of underreported people who get injured that just never yeah. get in that collision database. I think that's the m most important thing to say. And they're here and there on all our different, you know, on different streets. What do we mean by comfort? Can you help me understand the meaning of comfort? Yeah, it can, it can mean any number of things, but I think it's, you know, the, the, really I think what that gets at is the experience of all users. And um, whereas a facility can be safe, technically, um, but if it isn't uh, comfortable and people and I'm, you know, I guess I'm talking about all road users, whether it's transit riders or pedestrians or cyclists, but if, if, they don't, if the perception is that it's not, and it gets to more than just safety, but it's also the, uh, it's almost like that concept from San Jose, they talked about the happiness index. If it's sort of a, a street that's celebrated or a street that's um, enjoyable or a street that uh, you want to walk down or you want to ride your bike on. So I think it's, it's that notion of the whole experience of being a transportation user moving through the city. Okay. From my point of view, when I look at climate impacts, I think that is an outcome of everything before it. So uh, speed mitigation and traffic mitigation, where would that be? What, what category would capture that? I would say that would be in the safety collision reduction. That would be in, mm. that'd be in that category. Mm. Mm. It's not speed that causes the collisions though. It could also go into comfort. It could go into comfort as well. Yeah, some of it is, com I would agree. I think that is probably multiple categories. All right, have people, people all voted and submitted? This should be cumulative, by the way. So as you all submit your responses, you do have to submit for it to capture it. Um, so far, it looks like safety for, from a safe routes to school perspective is ranking the highest, followed by access to destinations, connectivity. Can, can I, and, if I'm, oh, go ahead. The, the, I was just going to explain how this 
can be instructive and helpful to us in setting the prioritization is this will help us understand your relative rankings of these different categories um, so that when we develop and finalize that prioritization criteria, it's indicative of, of your priorities and how important you think each of these categories would be from a prioritization perspective. I've helped you understand, if I look at Cuesta project, which was perhaps one of our biggest projects in the last year, mm -hmm. and I try to apply these, these uh, priorities to it, how, where, how, how would I rank Cuesta as being an important project? It's just, just for the sanity check. Um, if I may, I think it would drop into community identified need. They brought it to us. They said speed was a problem, help us. It was also safety for SRTS because it is a route to school for Covington. Um, so, and I think there was also a, a comfort aspect of it as well, um, reducing speeds on Questa so that people feel more comfortable using it as a transit option for bikes. So that's where I would put it, but that's just my perspective, my lens. I think that makes sense. Uh -oh. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to sort of gauge, you know, there's so much room for interpretation here. If every project's got so much latitude for interpretation, then you can drive a truck through this, uh, <laughs> through this uh, thesis here. Um, And, and, this, and this won't be the final say on prioritization, but I just wanted to explain how we're planning to use this. And so this will help us uh, craft that initial draft prioritization criteria and establish relative rankings. And there will, there will then be subsequent discussion on it. Got it. Um, and the one thing we, did everyone vote? Has everyone submitted their responses? Oh, sorry. Is there a submit button or do, don't we just? Yeah, you do need to submit. Oh, um, where's at the, the very bottom it says submit response, so oh, click no. on that or we won't have gotten your vote. Sorry, I'm the tech gap tonight. Okay, just a second, I'll do it. I, I did it. Okay, great. Let me see, did it change? Maybe you, you voted perfectly aligned with how everyone had already voted. I didn't even look, I wasn't even looking at it either. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, any, any final thoughts on this before we move into performance measurement, which is our sort of last module of the workshop? Yeah, so I had a question here. So these, um, is your proposal then be the, the, the prioritization criteria will be developed based on what the vision statement would be? Is this just a sample set? If we have so actually, the, the performance measurements will be more, more closely linked to the vision statement. This, this is for prioritizing all, this is also related, but this is for prioritizing the projects that will be in the Complete Streets Master Plan. So yeah, obviously coming out of that, there will be a project list of, of all the projects and this, this prioritization uh, framework will be used to, to rank, provide a relative ranking of all of those projects. I think we should make sure that, that this prioritization does not, is not in conflict with the vision statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just, just going to say, if there's anything that's missing, that's not represented, that we think the vision should that's actually the next uh, one, one question here. Were there any things that we missed? Um, was there a goal, a consideration? I don't think we have something on sustainability, for instance. And we have climate impacts. I'm still, for, for example, when you have limitations, and let's say you're trying to build a complete street, and it's only 12 feet wide. And something needs to give. How do you prioritize? I'm, uh, this is what I'm struggling with here. How do you set and say, look, this street, we're going to try to make it more for cars, and the one next to it is going to be for bikes or vice versa. How, how do we think through that? How do we use this, this template here to think through that? 
Yeah, so, so often we're having to choose between I want to park my car and I want the kid to get to school safely. And we tend to defer to I want to park my car. How do we use this to help us make those, those, those difficult choices and to choose one over another? The other thing that I'm still feeling like is like, I just feel like this is bike heavy. Where's my pets? Where's my pedestrians? Where's that tripping hazard on the sidewalk? Where's that, that degraded footpath prioritization in here? How do I put that in here? To me, that's missing. Right. Um, can, can I just, uh, this is a total random thought, but as you, everybody's been talking, I've been closing my eyes and thinking about cities where I see a vision. And what came to my mind was um, I ride my bike a lot to Stanford University and to the college terrace area around Palo Alto. And if I think about Palo Alto, if I think about the whole college terrace area, I can close my eyes and see what the streets represent there. If I think about other sections of Palo Alto, they're extremely different, right? You've got the um, older part of Palo Alto, You've got the um, area that's around Charleston. You've got the industrial area. And so what, it, what appears to me is the community identified need. The vision that I see is that the community, if there is a vision around what fits that community perfectly, then, and you can work towards that vision, you can wind up with complete streets that serve that community and all of the users within that community. And, and it doesn't matter. Um, in College Terrace, you can tell that that's, it prioritizes pedestrians and bicycles over, over cars going everywhere because of all the um, streets that are constrained. In other areas, it doesn't, right? Because it doesn't make any sense to do that. So maybe um, that needs to be higher on the list. And maybe the vision isn't one vision for the whole community, but it's a vision that is appropriate to each usage area. And I don't know if that helps or hurts this whole process, that kind of discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great thought, Steve, but, but I, I, you know, I, I wish that Los Altos feels and thinks the way Palo Alto does, because we often, when we address big projects like that, we find that the community, even the local community, is divided. And often we cannot reach a consensus. Uh, and so we have to help the community kind of reach a consensus. And that's where these, the vision and, and these priorities would ho hopefully guide the various folks into sort of seeing a, a common ground and a common good for all of us. But you think you're right. I mean, if, if, you know, here's an example. Palo Alto has got a lot of one-way streets, intentionally one-way streets. Mm -hmm. I, my goodness, I w by what process or priority can we sort of suggest, remotely suggest, turning some of our streets into one-way streets? Well, we to answer that, to answer that, Nadim, if you think about downtown and how challenging it is for cyclists, um, if if the grid downtown had one-way streets, maybe that would be an improvement. I don't know. But that's one example. Well, I mean, that was, that's a great point, Steve, because that was exactly what, we, what was floated around last year with the closed, uh, what, what do you call that, with the open streets in downtown. Mm -hmm. And that, that was, not, it was not a welcome idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think these are the things that I'm trying to sort of, hey, how do we then use these priorities to promote, in some respect, bold ideas in the future that can really bring consensus? And, and I, I have a couple thoughts or options that I can share with the group sort of on that topic. Um, one is that I've seen other communities actually um, set a modal um, hierarchy, if you will, for different street types. So for instance, uh, in your downtown area, you can have a modal hierarchy that says that you know, pedestrians are the most important mode, for instance, and that they'll be prioritized in downtown versus say a more of an arterial or collector roadway where it's actually important to move cars and that, that maybe pedestrians aren't as high. But that, that can be one way is you can sort of do it by area or by road type and you can have a relative ranking of all the modes. 
Um, so that's a spatial approach. Uh, another approach is just by sort of the policy and you can have it in your vision and you can have it in your goals and you can sort of be, and it's a little bit looser. Like the, the one that's doing spatial is actually, you're clearly defining what your modal priorities are. Whereas if you just put it in your language, it's a little uh, looser and uh, amorphous. I am going to suggest we, we move on to this next pattern. I did want to have it, if you thought we missed any criteria, I did want to provide the opportunity to write those in um, for the prioritization. We thought just in those eight, if we missed a key factor. Uh, one other thing I would note, we didn't have anything in there on cost or feasibility, and that is a typical thing that we do consider and is important in prioritization. So if you think there, there should be you know, a cost or um, other, other factor that just we can list there. And this, this is just quickly, if you just put in additional criteria that you'd like us to add or consider adding to the overall prioritization criteria. Uh, should we put it in the chat or should we speak? Um, you, you should have, if you're in poll everywhere, you, 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 I see some people are already putting it in. It should show up if you just type in the response um, and then hit submit, we'll capture it. And Sam, just question while everybody's working on that. And then are, are we, I think you said we were, but we're going through the measurements in one of your next things. Okay. The, next, the, the, the next and final session is about performance measurement. Yeah. So this is really about, you know, like I said, this is about prioritization of projects. And this next one is how are we measuring success? You know, how, how are we sure that we've set this vision? How do we know if we're moving in the right direction and actually accomplishing what we set out to accomplish? Is everyone finished? Is, did, it sounds like maybe we got most of it. Let me know. I don't want to. I don't want to cut you short if you're typing something in. Maybe I'll give it another 15, 20 seconds. And Sam, just to I, just to ask, if I understand, everyone in the community is able to participate with us in this exercise right now, too, right? Who's on this meeting? I believe so. Yeah, anyone on this call yeah, can, great. can go. Yeah. Thank you. I haven't figured out how to type it in. So can I just talk? Yeah, if you if you if you talk or if you chat it, we can we can actually add it in ourselves. Uh, can I just talk for a minute? Yep. So uh, I think the walking spaces are really important, um, and sometimes for that you need wider sidewalks, especially if we have to build the buildings taller. Um, uh, and with that, the other thing that I think that's really important is street trees. I mean, if you look at Palo Alto, how some of those streets are based on street trees and it just really changes the, the feeling of the street. And also just having really wide walkable spaces. Um, street trees also lower the temperature and they provide a lot of greenery and once you build buildings out to its footprint and you lose that uh, growing space, it's gone. So I would say just that's, I mean, and if you look at towns like Savannah, Georgia, that's an amazing town, like as far as how it's planned. So I would, I don't know what you call it, like urban walkability with street trees, something like that. I, I, I don't know, but I don't know if you're thinking like that. Um, when they were trying to do the, the little triangle, thing at Loyola Corners. They were just trying to build right out to the street and leave very little bit of walking space. And it was just like, ah, I don't know. So that's it. Thank you. Any, any final comments before we move on to the performance measures? Great. Thanks. Oh, it looks like we're still getting some comments here on criteria. Any should we close this out? Are people still typing other criteria worth considering? 
I'm going to take that as a no. I'm going to move on. Okay, so performance measures. Sorry about those lines on the screen there, by the way. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but I've just been ignoring them. Hopefully you can too. Uh, okay, so how we measured success in Los Altos. Um, these were uh, performance measures, goals for the bike plan. Um, so securing funding and staff time for bike projects, increasing back to school and work rates, um, obviously increased miles of bikeways, uh, more bike parking, and decreased bicycle related collisions. Uh, this was one from the Monterey Bay area, complete street sidewalk. Um, again, ones related to safety also help um, to getting uh, more people walking and biking, um, more students doing that. Um, there was also some economic benefit assessments from uh, you know, business activity, investment in the community, and then also an equity factor. This one. Um, more related to disadvantaged populations though. Uh, in Phoenix, uh, again, a number of different goals from increasing mode share, having to do with active transportation, um, ADA compliance is, is one of their goals, increasing the number of bus stops that are ADA compliant. Uh, BMT, reducing BMT per capita and then some equity related ones as well. Uh, Burbank um, had one sort of about traffic calming and reducing speeds in the city. Uh, also one about counts of actually are we, are we increasing people walking, biking and taking transit. Um, they also had a lot of storm water runoff and sort of related to sort of bioswales and bioretention. Uh, also had a tree canopy and they were concerned about the change in tree canopy and, and looking to increase it over time. Um, okay, so uh, we want to do another exercise where we get your thoughts on what you think, um, how, you, how you'd like Los Altos to be measuring success. And we sort of pre-populate it with these overarching categories of uh, activity. So this would be one about you know, measuring people walking, biking, taking transit, uh, one related to climate change. And, uh, and there could be multiple measures there too, but we, we just give an example of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, economic impact, uh, equity, uh, and again, this is, as noted earlier, this could be geographic equity um, or uh, serving communities with fewer resources, et cetera. Um, and then also mileage, just this is a facilities. So uh, mileage of bikeways, mileage of pedestrian facilities could be transit related as well. Um, resources, so funding. You know, how important is, is funding and as a, as a measure? Are we getting funding for, obviously, it's important to, to construct facilities. Um, so I think that was all the category. Oh, and safety, yeah, reducing collisions. So it's so, similar so, exercise as the last one where you just go in and rank the relative importance of each. So is this, is this in a perfect world? Because honestly, we can't measure any of this today. We can't count the number of people walking with any degree of accuracy. We certainly can't track any greenhouse gas emissions with any degree of accuracy. So is this in the perfect world if we had a great measuring stick and a huge staff that could go out and count the kids as they walk to school each day? I, to me, this is a little pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would say this should be based in reality and this should be something that we can so, actually So implement. based on reality, we can't, we can't track any of this with any degree of certainty? Um, yeah, so, so certainly the safety, the safety one we definitely have data on. We can track the safety one. Um, the counts, you're right, it's, it's hard to do that at a citywide level and have good data for especially active modes. 
Um, but some of, some of these may also just highlight the need for some better data sets. But I, I would say that we should be realistic in terms of making sure that these are goals and performance measures that are in fact trackable and we have data for because otherwise it's not very helpful, is it? No, and having gone through two complete streets master plans, all of them that you highlighted tonight, I'm painfully aware of the lack of data and ability to track success. So, so Suzanne, here's a question. If projects had defined goals and objectives and you measured how many projects got funded based on what the goals and objectives were for that project. So for example, a traffic calming project like Cuesta, mm -hmm. um, you know, was completed. Um, there were a lot of other projects completed, like filling potholes and repaving right. streets and doing whatever. Why can't you measure success based upon the actual projects that are done over a certain period of time, rather than trying to assess results that you can't really measure? Because most of the goals of these projects are qualitative, not quantitative. What is traffic calming? I don't know. Do I knock on the well, doors of everybody on Quest and say, is the traffic calmer now? So I don't know. Maybe, but what if the goals were stated differently? Uh, again, I, I, just, I just know personally of the challenge, the data challenge that we face. And, and I, I will quite be quiet about that because I'm sure Nadim's heard me before on this score. So I will. Yeah, I mean, I hear you, uh, Suzanne. I think your concern is very valid. But also, we have to measure something that's realistic. We, we can't just sort of not do anything. So let me put that question back to you. What should we measure? Realistic. I mean, you can't do that because we do measure speed. We measure number of cars. So we do measure stuff. Now, maybe not everything, but we do measure stuff. How much more do we need to measure? Right. I mean, I, I don't have a great answer unless the city's willing to step up and really lean into some of these um, tracking and data collection efforts around these projects, you know, going back to Cuesta and saying, and how did it work? What are our speeds? Have they dropped? What yeah. about El Monte? What about Covington? And, and go back, you know, but we, we have such little capacity to, to, to do that. I mean, if we've got 19 projects on the docket right now and we have two community meetings per project, one kickoff meeting for the project, one meeting post project times twenty. Yeah, but I think my, my, I know, but I think what we should be thinking as a commission sort of say, look, if you city want to go push eighteen projects, you must have the resources and the cost to, to complete do this. to do yeah. this. Yeah, that's a good point. Don't do the project without an ability to measure its success. Right. Got it. Yeah, I think that's why I liked, was it Sam, your comment about maybe that just points to something that we need to change. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just share a, a, an experience. We're finishing up the, the comprehensive motor plan in Mountain View. And one of the key findings from that plan was that they had inadequate data. Um, everyone wanted us to be considering pedestrian and bicycle usage activity in the prioritization. And it just that data set didn't exist as a citywide uh, data set. So we couldn't do it. And it's a one, it will be one of the recommendations that the city work towards developing a better data set. So that, you know, sometimes if that's, it looks like right now activity is coming up as the top number one goal for measurement. Can we actually put data set? I think your point is valid. I mean, we have exactly the same problem as Mountain View. What's yeah. our data set? We should put it in here too. Yep. Yeah. Could be, yeah. Needs to be part of the project. I mean, we, go ahead, Suzanne. Um, you know, we, we need to be able to demonstrate an ROI on these projects. What's the return on investment? 
And today, we can't do that. If I remember correctly, I think in our work plan, we specifically called out that every project should have as part of its proposal, measurement, and um, and post uh, postmortem a uh, um, an aspect of the project that measures data and community inputs. I guess right? so. I think that's something we should highlight here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, let me let me highlight that point. I think mean, it's valid because we are now committing to what two and a half or two odd million dollars a year on resurfacing projects because we want to bring the PCI to whatever them I think 70, 75, 76 over the next few years. So that's a tangible measurement with a tangible priority with a tangible project or set of projects behind it. I was, I was going to make a comment on the, the second thing. I know we all voted it high. Um, one other aspect, uh, not just mileage, but I know our, as a commission, we've discussed like pathways, connected pathways. So it's not necessarily, it's not really doing a justice, justice if we just increase the mileage, but they need to be connected. So I don't know, how, I don't know if that's tweaking the measurement or if that if that's part of the vision, then it's just assumed that that's what we're talking about. Right. And that that can be a specific measure. So it could be a um, connected. Sometimes we have a measure of like connected low stress facilities or connected pedestrian facilities. Um, or, it, or there's also a island analysis where we look at how far can you go within a certain distance and still be connected via seamless pedestrian and bicycle facilities. But that's a good point. I'll capture that connectivity uh, measure. And I would also just say at the same time without making our list too long. So maybe I would tend to agree with Cindy, maybe that gets combined somehow with connectivity or the, with mileage and maybe the lead headline is connectivity because mm -hmm. we're not adding new roads in this city. I mean, it really is mm -hmm. bike facilities and pedestrian facilities, yeah. And then the other comment I wanted to make on, I agree with what Commissioner Ambiel and our chair was saying about measurement. And I think within our measurement, we should also think of, we should also measure our community engagement. Were we effective in our community engagement? <laughs> Okay, and has everyone, has everyone voted and submitted their responses? Okay. Uh, and we did, I, I thought I should have noted that we had another category here for, did we miss anything? So I know you just said, oh yeah, connectivity, engagement, data sets. So um, if you don't mind, if you could add those in here, and that, that at least, I, I noted it down, but I want to make sure we have it in the system too. I wonder if, uh, Customer satisfaction would would be a measurement that would be valuable. I mean, for instance, with the traffic calming, if we did a post project survey, you know, because usually traffic calming goes in because a neighborhood sees the need and they approach us. Um, well, maybe after so many months of operation, we you know at, we poll them. Are you satisfied? You know, what can be different? What could be improved? what's successful. I, I, I think that's a good idea, Jim. I know, Stacey, I'm wondering, is that what you meant by are we effective, were we effective in our community engagement? It, it is, yes, it's exactly part of that. And, and part of it is the what is the opinion and input of the community of how we did and also what is our own opinion of how we did right like what levels of outreach did we do how did we do them we need to do our own analysis of were they effective what did the outreach say you know how did the community respond to what they what we said you know when when they showed up were they were they ready and collaborative to work with us or 
you know, were they unhappy and, you know, wanting to, you know, not, you know, not have a lot of trust in us to start, like, just, just looking at those different things. But I, I think Jim's idea, it, it fits in with the um, analysis to also go back and ask people, you know, you got the, you know, the projects in now, what do you, what, what did you, what do you think both about the process that you worked with this commission on? And what do you think about the project that was implemented? Well, you know, I also think we have to define terminology. Um, for example, the mileage on complete streets. I didn't think that that meant the total mileage on all the streets in Los Altos. I thought that we were defining a complete street as something other than just a street. And so as projects turn streets into complete streets, that's the mileage that was increasing. But maybe I misunderstood that. A good point. The devil's always in the detail of how you define terminology. Uh, and I think it could be, I think when we use the sense mileage, it could be any number of things from just complete streets. It could be bike facilities. It could be, uh, you know, sidewalks. It could be improving the number of uh, uh, low stress connections via bicycling. But I think those are the details that will put the specific measures in once we agree what the relative uh, perform the, the priority performance measures are for the overall plan. Any other sort of key performance measures or factors that people want to add in before we move from this section? I was just going to add it in the chat, but since you're calling verbally for comments, so there's been some discussion about green and trees and things like that. I, I think I just want us to, to get us thinking about not only adding trees, but taking care of the ones we have, because this is a really big deal for the climate. And I think we're kind of not really paying attention to this now and trees are, you know, getting lost. You know, I can just look out my house and go, oh, well, you know, 10 years ago, there were 20 more trees out there, big old growth ones, and they, they're not there anymore. So it's not just about planning new small ones, but taking care of what we have, because there'll be a long-term impact on Most our of those trees are at the end of their lifetime. They've died. So then we need a plan to, the to move forward. Okay. Right. Okay, any other? Any other final thoughts? I think we're just going to go into next steps now, but I just wanted to pause if there are any other. Uh, I would say budget, like how close are we to meeting our on time, on budget goals? Um, you know, how, how close do we keep our projects on scope? Um, um, yeah, but I think we need to be careful not to step in the shoes of the true. staff here, right? We're, we want to advise them on the bigger picture and not do their job. Fair. And maybe it's embedded with safe routes to school, but I would actually think of it as a little broader, more education and encouragement. I mean, now during the pandemic, I see so many people out on the streets and they're my neighbors, right? And we don't get to stop and hug each other, but you know, we get to wave and do whatever. There's just something nice to see people walking around versus like everybody racing in their car. And you know, I, not everybody's running me over and you know, the sidewalk, but you know, some of them are. And so now when everybody's just out there walking around, I think one of the San Jose ones was talking about placemaking and stuff. I don't think we have that level. We're not that urban city of placemaking, but just having people out, I, I think is a, you know, something for us to think about of what we want our community to be in the future. Any, any other final thoughts, measures, key factors? Okay, now I'll, um, I'll wrap up with some next steps. So as I've mentioned, we'll be drafting a memo really summarizing the results of this workshop, uh, laying out uh, probably a, a couple different uh, vision statements for your consideration, uh, capturing the, the overall prioritization uh, criteria, and then as well as the performance measures that we just discussed. Um, and then as part of the overall, complete streets master plan, 
uh, we'll be coming back in April with proposed improvements and project lists. And of course, that's where the prioritization comes in. Um, there is a study session on project prioritization in June. And then in this summer, we'll have the, sort of, you know, the overall draft plan check with city council. And then we'll be uh, releasing the public draft of the final plan in August to September of this year. Great. And I think that summarizes our presentation. Um, Thank so you, Sam and um, the team and the Alta team. That was uh, quite productive. Um, so I guess we'll have another checkpoint in, in about a month time frame, right? With, with the with the with the uh, memo from uh, from Alta. Great. So once we get the memo, I guess um, what happens then? We'll um, we will have a chance to give you some feedback or uh, uh, and then iterate that. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll submit it sort of be, you know via staff and I know that circulated with, uh, Got with the Complete Streets Commission. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, and how does it tie then to the the master plan itself? How, f from a timing standpoint, sequentially, who what comes first, and how does it tie together with the master plan? Yeah, this will be fully in it. Obviously, the vision statement and the performance measures and the uh, the prioritization criteria, they're all integral parts of the master plan. So this will feed into the, the actual okay. development of the plan. Okay. And I also want to make sure that the staff has the opportunity of chiming in on this thing because if they come back and sort of say, great, commission, you've, you've thought a lot of stuff, but we can't implement it, we, we need to know about that. Or very early on. Um, so I think I want to encourage uh, Jim and Jaime and their teams to um, to really chime in very strongly on on anything that does not make sense to them. Suresh. Yeah, I just want to add to that. On the flip side, is if they cannot do it, then come back and say, for example, measuring activity. And uh, it seems like that's one of the no, that's our number one. Uh, uh, on, the, on the list of, of measuring success um, and then maybe come back and say what what it takes to, 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 to make that measurement happen. Right, right. Jim, I mean, any, any thoughts you want to add or maybe, maybe you want to think about it, come back to us or? Um, yeah, I think I need to think about it, but I know as we were, as you all were talking about, you know, data collection, I mean, Jaime had to uh, depart, but he, he, he's probably a little more familiar with some of the, the new data collection technology. Uh, you know, we had a video counter during open streets that counted the number of pedestrians, you know. Um, and so I, I, I think there are tools and apps out there that we could use to you know, track cars and track pedestrians. I mean, it just, it, it's not cheap, but, it, you know, perhaps we can, you know, do some grab samples or at least start planning for that and kind of brainstorming, you know, what, what are ways we can collect data uh, given some of the technology that's out there. Okay, cool. Sam, uh, thank you very much and Alta team. Appreciate that. That was productive. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Great. Um, so with that, I think we're going to move on to item number four. I want to kind of rip through the rest of it and see if we can adjourn before nine o'clock tonight. Um, so uh, staff report. I guess if Jaime is not here, Jim, uh, are you going to do that or are we going to punt? I apologize. Um, Jaime was not um, feeling well, and uh, oh, okay. I didn't realize there was a fourth item after this. So Look, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. If you're not ready, then you're not ready. We can adjourn that to the next, uh, the uh, next meeting, or you can send out a report by email. Okay. Um, Maybe touch you, on the striping item from last night. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. Um, no, this is a just monthly staff report. So um, just um, some few items, quick items for update. 
Uh, we have the council member uh, Weinberg. Go ahead, please. I thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know what, what Jaime had intended to report to you, but two things that did happen last night at the council meeting that I think this commission would, would just want to be apprised about is number one, the restriping of Almond Avenue was pulled from the consent calendar, and it's going to be considered by the council on uh, March 9th. And I'm expecting there to be a, a significant amount of public input uh, at the Complete Streets Commission. I guess it's too late to try to put together a report. Uh, but if any of the commissioners wanted to show up and, and let us know what your thoughts were, I think that that would be in order and it would be appreciated. And the other thing that I thought I wanted, that I would like to let you know, is that uh, council approved the project at 140 Lyell. I know that it had come before you uh, at least once, maybe twice last year. Uh, and, and there were some mentioned by the commission uh, previously that you'd like to know what happens once the project comes to you. So. Uh, 140 Lyell was approved. There, there's a couple of wrinkles that have to be ironed out, but it's moving forward. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Weinberg. Uh, we, I, at least myself and the vice chair, will be at the March 9 uh, meeting. Great. Thank you. All right. And uh, Nadim, if I may. Yeah, of course. We have a lot of new commissioners, and I think we used to have a process, a kind of sort of a policy about speaking at the council meeting and representing the commission. I don't know if you want to just share that with our new members. You know, we kind of had a process, but I think that process actually was kind of, wasn't really working. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, what, we, what I found was that um, uh, uh, the commissioners are invited to participate. And contrary to the old habits, I think they're encouraged to participate as a commissioner, uh, not as a private citizen. It's their choice to 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 um, to decide which which way they want to be represented. So I think I want to leave it to the discretion of the commissioners to uh, to speak at those events. Okay, that's perfect, and I think that helps me and Suzanne and anyone else that's been around here too for clarity for us because that was yeah, and that was clarity that we got from City Council and the previous City Council that you know we should be encouraged to participate as members of the commission. Um, um, yes, Suresh, go ahead, please. Um, so when you mean participate, can you clarify that? Um, yeah, so, so so typically when an item uh, comes in front of City Council that's been already discussed and debated at the commission and city council of course would be seeking input in their deliberation in particular to that topic then the commissioners uh, obviously can can provide their opinion not in total vacuum but in relationship to how the commission deliberated and how the commission came to whatever uh, recommendation so to give city council the context and the color of how the commission reached that particular recommendation. And assisting, ultimately assisting city council in making the proper decision. So again, if, however, if, if the commissioners wish to have a personal opinion, then you're free to do so. And then you will announce yourself that you're representing your own personal opinion, not reflecting on what the commission deliberated and what came out as the a recommendation of the commission. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Yeah, I would encourage that. I noticed um, Parks and Rec Commission is, is good at that and showing up for public comment and providing their opinions um, one way or another. Yeah, and, and I think given, given the complexities of the topics that we deal with, Often a written report is is partial in giving to city council a complete picture, uh, and I think again having uh, members of this commission provide that context, provided that whatever that information is is consistent with the deliberation of the commission. Um, Great, so with that, let's move to the next item, which is future agenda items. And I know that we have already a long list, so it, it, let's not be redundant, please. Let's try to make sure that we add things that are constructive to that list and not just simply piling things up. I 
Actually, I'm sorry. I jumped. I apologize. Actually, I skipped one item. I, my, my, my mistake. Commissioners reports and comments. And in particular, really what I want to hear about is the task force um, feedback. Yeah, and that, thanks, Chair. Uh, I had us also, Chair, to save time to for me to make the comments here during this time. Um, to not, the main question I have is, for some of the task force meetings, actually all the task force meetings, they're uh, being hosted during the daytime um, to accommodate folks from the Youth Commission and other attendees. Um, and that time is difficult for me to manage around uh, work schedule. So the main question I have for the rest of the commissioners so that we I don't hold up uh, the task force and Commissioner Ambiel is if anybody would be available to substitute in for the task force meetings. So I would recommend that we have an alternate and that the two main individuals um, tap the alternate when needed. So if, if we could do that, that would be helpful. Cindy, I noticed the same thing. The timing was extraordinarily inconvenient um, in my calendar and I had to pitch a lot of things off the, off the side and not listen to everybody cry at work. Um, so I think having an alternate would be uh, a, a great help. Um, in the last task force meeting, I think um, my comment as I walked away, frustrated and disappointed. I was thrilled to see some earnest, engaged people that I've never met before uh, as task force members, but I was dismayed at the um, expediency with which staff uh, ran through all of the projects. Um, and I felt like many of the people were, for, they, they wanted to say something and they were basically shut down. One person has commented, we can only take one comment per thing. We have to get through all of this. There was a, there was a sense of completing their presentation versus engaging the, the community. That was the priority. And I felt like, I understand you have to get through all these things, but at the same time, we could have opened it up to office hours. We could have done some additional things that felt like people were, uh, that, that their commitment and their interaction was cherished and not sort of tossed aside. Yeah, valuable feedback. Um, you know, Jim, I think I know there's a sense that we want to push through the concept designs here, but I really want to encourage the city staff and Jaime and his team in particular to really just be patient. The last thing we ought to do as a commission is to support a process that was immensely accelerated, that is not capturing all the input from all the stakeholders. And, and the commission ought to be the biggest supporter of these, F, F, of these projects. And when I hear from the two commissioners on the task force who are, who are frustrated, that doesn't bode well. So I don't know what suggestions you may have. Maybe we need to have some additional supervision perhaps for these things, or perhaps open it up to office hours as Commissioner MBL is suggesting. All of those I, I think are thought to be mechanisms to really open up the engagements. Maybe even you know at these different locations, put up the sandwich board with the concept plan, and put a suggestion box, just a box, put your comments in. A lot of people are very challenged by the Zoom environment. You saw some of that tonight. Um, it's hard for them to raise their hands and know what's appropriate to say when and where. There are many people who just can't access this platform. It's just not how they're able to communicate. I feel like we're missing all of that perspective. So maybe there's another more non-digital way that we can collect that input and, and embrace those uh, community members. And I saw the our city council liaison here shaking your head, I guess, when our commissioner was speaking. Is that an agreement or were you present at the task force? And if you can give us your comments, that'd be great too. I'm on the task force and I thought Commissioner Ambiel said it very well. I, I felt exactly the same. And um, 
Director Sandoval, I, if you could get the message to, to Jaime, I know he likes to run a very tight ship, but I'm thinking especially when we have uh, our meetings regarding St. Joseph and regarding Loyola Corners, there's gonna be a lot of people with a lot to say, and a lot of it is going to be repetitive, but that process is really important for the residents of the yeah. South. It, it really is. And I, I think, Jim, I, I love the suggestions from Commissioner Ambiet in terms of open it up a box, let people write their own comments and put them in. I think, I think the Zoom environment is indeed challenging for many, and I think we should really make it easy for folks to contribute their opinions without feeling that pressure. Um, any, any other, uh, actually, I want to go back to, uh, to the point about the, um, uh, the timing of the events and, and the meetings, I should say. First, let me ask our other fellow commissioners here, any volunteers to participate on our task force as primary or as an alternate? And I can tell you folks, if you're new to the commission, there's no better training round than participating in those meetings. Wow, the resigning. When, when are the meetings? It depends, but they tend to book them earlier in the day, three in the afternoon, four in the afternoon. I haven't seen one in the morning yet, but that wouldn't surprise me either. Um, and I think that it's incumbent on city staff as much as possible to give us three or four weeks lead time on, on these, these day meetings because that's how far out we all book our calendars. And if you give me two weeks notice, it's actually not enough time. So I'd be happy to be an alternate and with the caveat that the whoever I'm working with that we have an opportunity to talk about what's happened, uh, expectations, what's going to happen at that meeting that I attend, what you'd like to see move forward, and I'd be happy to attend that because I'm retired and I could do it early. Most Wonderful, time. Steve. Uh, I know that Suresh also has a question or perhaps that was a volunteer hand. I'm not sure. I had, I had a question and I think uh, uh, the question is answered. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to also um, uh, volunteer as, a, as an alternate, um, but I would appreciate, you know, more than two weeks of notice if that would be possible. Great. So, so I, I, I think uh, our director here probably got the point here to communicate that to Jaime in terms of scheduling. But thank you, Steve and Suresh, for uh, volunteering as alternates. I'm going to suggest that, you know, without having to get stuck into the Brown Act, I'm going to pair you. So maybe, you know, Cindy and, and Steve and then, and then Commissioner Ambiel with Suresh separately, then you get to uh, communicate to each other separately without having to cross-communicate your findings and your um, observations of the task force so they can be up to speed. Great. And so we have to be careful of the Brown Act. Yeah, I yeah. think we're, we're subcommittee are fine. I'm sorry? I said if, if the two of us act as a subcommittee, we can be fine, can we not? And there's no need for a subcommittee here. You just have one communication separate of that one and where you and, and Cindy will talk independent of each other. At Perfect. Yeah, it's just to avoid the four of us talking together. That's right. I don't want the four of you or any three of you of the four to communicate together. That's right. Great. Uh, then thank back you. to, yes, go ahead. Thank you to both of you. No, I was just going to say thank you to both of you for supporting us. Director Sandoval, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so just to understand, it, it, what I'm hearing from you is that both the task force meetings and the public workshops are, they need some improvement. It's not just the task force, right? Because I, I think Count, Councilman Weinberg, uh, was referring to today's workshop perhaps being a little rushed and not providing enough time or, or dialogue with residents. Is, is that what I'm hearing? I, I was actually referring to the task force yes, meeting. Force. I, I thought it was really okay. pronounced there. And I think it was so pronounced because you had volunteer members of the community, I think who, who are, are at a high level of engagement. And those are people who, even, even with that, high level of engagement and thought, Jaime was pushing them through. Um, okay. We saw it again today. Uh, just the, the, because you had 150 participants, I think it was understood 
how it had to move, but I thought the task force really felt like it was under the whip. That, that, that's just his style. I mean, I, I, I get that. I understand why he does that. And if we're paying him hourly, there, there's you know, a monetary concern. Um, but at the task force, I really felt the same as Commissioner Ambio. I, I, I really did. And uh, do you have any feedback about today's workshop? So if I may, I, um, I liked the format last month of the workshop where we took a smaller number of streets and then did one street at a time where Jaime presented, then we took the public feedback on that street and then moved to the next one. Versus today, it was just double the size of streets and everything was mi mixed together. And I think we even heard from some of the community members who were saying, we didn't really get to substantively say anything about this. And then they were all asking for their another workshop, another workshop, another workshop, which we didn't, and, and, and certainly, some of those streets need more workshops, um, but some of those streets may not need work more drill in till the future. And I think when we last month, Jim, nobody asked us for an extra drill in because I feel like everybody felt they had the time to give that feedback. So maybe if we just go slow to go fast. And 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 I would say to camp on that is is you know less is more, less is more. We had some street resurfacing, some projects. We had some in South Los Altos, North Los Altos. If we can group them so that people can feel an affinity towards them um, and, and reduce the number that we cover, I think that will be helpful as well. There were way too many projects. There were way too many um, inside language that I know because I've lived this for so long. But for many people, they don't under, they didn't understand much of what Alta was saying at all. And that exclusionary language, which is professional language in, in the street design, is exclusionary to the community because they don't know what it means to close off a slip lane. <laughs> and yeah, now they're worried, like, they're, I'm losing my slip lane. Should, should I be concerned? Yeah, that's a great point. I think, uh, uh, Jim, that I want to highlight. You know, I'm a trained engineer myself, and, and engineers can speak engineering language to engineers, but they really can't. They need to change the method, the speed, and the language when you're educating others. Um, and I think to a large extent, um, what we're trying to do in those uh, wor uh, workshops is really educate more than just try to accomplish engineering tasks. Great. Thank uh, you. Great, feedback. great. So thank you, by the way, for all the input. Uh, I'm going to move now to the next agenda item, which is future agenda items. And again, right, Chair, may I give two bullet points on some of the other meetings? Yes. Nothing on the VTA BPAC. On TSCN, the Traffic Safe Communities Network, to spell out the jargon, um, there was a good presentation on um, from the San Jose State, the Mineta Transportation people, and they did a bunch of research on ride sharing um, to enhance mobility in the elderly population. I can send the link to Gaku or Jaime in case you guys want it, and he can send it out to everyone, and I'm going to ask that it goes to the senior commissioner, members of the senior commission who followed transportation. Yeah, thank and you. thank you, Stacey. I, I want to encourage us, in, instead of having to talk through these things yep. at every commission meeting, to compile that into a simple oh, report, man. send it to city staff, and they can distribute that for us. We can read it offline. OK. Great. Awesome. Any last thoughts before we adjourn here? Great, and I want to really thank uh, uh, Jim and Jaime for organizing the session tonight. I think that was very productive. Thank you. Great, so this meeting is adjourned. Good night. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.